Welcome to another episode of the Bandwagon Podcast. And um, today was, uh, this episode in particular, I'm going to say it from the outset. There's a couple of conditions based on this um, on this episode. One is very rarely do I ever get kind of nervous in, in some people's presence. or or um, And as you know, I do like to talk. Uh, but I have a long history, not with this person, but as a, as a, from a family and where we go back. Um, and I'll I'll explain that in the journey when we talk through it as well because he might not even know himself. Um, oh, but this was a uh, this one is is one for um, especially for Pangra heads. Um, and the way that I want to do this is not to piss any kind of Pangra pure heads off. So I want him to kind of give the the dates and the key things because when you try and research people sometimes. There's some people who have not their, their their credibility and their history hasn't been documented down, and so dates and things like that can vary. And if you get one date wrong, some people go crazy. So, without further ado, Mr. Butta Jagpa, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, I know you've been after me for <laughs> ages and ages. Uh, luckily, we met up last week. I oh, know. Uh, I did put uh, you in a position, especially at one of them. I was like, oh, you got to do it. You got to do it. No, I mean, that's the, I, I, I do apologize beforehand, but that's the only way you're going to get get hold of me to do this. So if you're physically in front of me to say, come on, man, Karde Honor. Yeah, I'm yeah. Like, oh, then, and then, so when I gave you a date, I had to. I was, I was happy I got blue ticks on the messages. I was, uh, on WhatsApp. Well, I was, I was I all know, right. I know, I know, I know, I know for a fact that you've been on the, um, texting me and WhatsApping me for, from ages going, I know, come on, I know. just do this for me. And so I'm here. I'm here. I know. No, it's because, you know what it is? It's because of when you, when you do a certain amount of podcasts and you have the same kind of characters coming in, it's really important to get their, their um, angle and their, their opinions on those situations to get the complete picture. Mm-hmm. And I think, unfortunately, this over the past 18 months two years we've seen huge characters in the industry getting lost as well and I think it just gives you even more of that that impotence of saying look whoever's you know around now and doing it it's important to get their stories documented the best you can from your opinion fair play, um, fair play. and uh, so I think this is this is kind of my attempt on it to be honest <laughs> but m- mainly as a fan in terms of uh like getting information out of you and, and doing this so thanks we'll, and, and we'll it's see no, how it goes in. yeah we'll see how it goes you know you probably want to kill me after the end of this show because yeah, yeah, as, yeah, as, yeah. as a fan i need some answers man <laughs> I need some all right go for it go okay. for it so i just want to start off um you know you're a handsworth lad you you the family the jag pal family is synonymous with handsworth and has its uh, roots in in the UK Pongra as well, and I would say world Pongra the way that the way you know your impact has. Describe to me what a young Buddha was like. Uh, oh, that's a good one. Oh, you, uh, uh, when you're saying young Buddha, well, what age are you talking about? I, I mean, like it depends how deep you want to go because obviously there, there's there's loads of different angles to go go with this. But I just want to just you know from your opinion. Um, um, what kind of um. I think I was just a just a, a normal person, but you know, um, I did have the passion for music. Um, I had a band at school as well, um, so I mean, it started as, as a young age, about twelve, thirteen, where um, I just I enjoyed just listening to music and um, just thought to myself, you know, it's it's a little passion. And my uh, I remember my um, father bought me a little organ kind of thing, um, just to mess around with, and um, I, I didn't know how to play piano or anything like that um so i typically the um the letters onto the keys and uh, so that's how i learned the you know, cd ef all that kind of stuff and um, just self-taught by uh, on that aspect but uh same time, so, i mean music was i don't know just it was some kind of thing that just felt nice um at the time it was um something in me just, just saying yeah just you know just keep at it keep at it one day you know you might get your breakthrough whatever um yep yeah. but as a person i was just i, I was just a normal teenager at that time you know going out with mates i didn't actually drink i always used to be the designated driver so um yeah so in a, in a nutshell yeah, yeah and so like you know you just said about your, your dad was such a legend i know my baba and my family like talk talked about him as kids because we grew up on grafton road i or linwood road and murdoch um just off Soho road and stuff 
and um, and like my grandma always used to go to opera uh, pageants uh, video and everything. so yeah. my whole my whole kind of young life was following my grandma to one shop to the other shop having a conversation and, and seeing it around so the, that Jack Powell name is huge you know how it no, I mean like, like, uh, like you mentioned uh, opera pageant he used he used to have um used to be in um, other bands at that time. He used to be in quite a few bands and used to help other bands out as well. And so, you know, obviously we used to be around there and we used to see all these bands turning up at his place to rehearse and that kind of stuff. And that was just like, you know, to myself, I, I was enjoying that and watching these, you know, young bands um, rehearsing at his place. And so that's why I, I sort of, you know, got into it, in, into that aspect because Bajan was into music well before any of us guys got into it. Um, so he, he's probably more of a legend than anyone, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, he's been on the podcast. And, oh, has he? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably, it, that's probably one, of, one of the longest podcasts you've ever done. Yeah, yeah I'll tell you what, dude. He actually, uh, he took a bit of a while warming up, man, to be honest. He was, nah, he's, then, he's then, always, he's then always then on, he got into on the game. Yeah, then he's that, always then on he, lock. He's always yeah, on lock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His his reaction one was, was crazy because I ended up going to a wedding the week after. And about, <laughs> and about Couple of the people we, we mentioned were there, and I was oh. like, "Oh God, am I going to get slapped up here?" <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> What's going on? Nah, he's, he's all right. He's all yeah. right, man. So you had a, you had a school musical band, uh, the the Jag Pal. So who was who was what what was the band called? I know it was just made up of you guys, but who, what was your inspiration? Because you've you've been an inspiration as a producer and a musician and an artist, I would say, for a lot of people. And I know you've got um, a bit of a I think sometimes you struggle to to understand the impact that you've had on other people. What you're you're sitting back and reflecting on what you've done. But who was your inspiration as you were growing up from a musical point of view? Um, that's really hard to say. I just I don't think I had anyone in the aspect of you know inspiration. I was just just actually to be honest, I was inspired by um, the live bands at that time because I used to go um, uh, video filming with. Um, either Pajan or Mata Aseva. Uh, so we used to go and do wedding films. And obviously, back in those days, it was all live bands. It was no DJs or PAs those days. It was just actual live bands. And I saw virtually every band in the UK from Alab, Hira, Apra Sangeet, Chirag Pachan, Azad, all those bands playing live. Um, and I also, honestly, to be honest with you, I, that's one of the reasons I used to go video filming was to, just to see these bands play at weddings. And, you know, for three, four hours, I'd be just mesmerized, like watching these bands. Yo, these guys are good, you know. Mm. Um, and so that's probably the the inspiration I um, got to get into music, just watching these bands, like, you know, performing every weekend. And was there your your relationship with, with, the, with the band, and especially the live scene, was there something in particular you saw, like, when you look at a band, like for me personally, like when I saw Gajan as a tour a tour player on on stage, I was like, I want to do that. You know that that that's the way he you know the way he moved with it. Yeah, yeah. Was there the you know the was there a particular kind of person that you saw in in the band that, that you saw? Okay, I want to play keys like that. Or um, no, 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 no. that to be honest, it was like um, we like I said, our first uh, thing was uh, we made a band at school, and so what happened. We obviously we, we finished the school and then we went for extra um, activity after school, and we ended up, ended up in the music room. As myself, Bali, uh, my cousin Jet and Raj, and uh, another cousin of ours, um, uh, Thari, and we just ended up in the music room, and everyone just jumped on a instrument. Um, Jet jumped uh, jumped on the drums, Raj he jumped on one of the keyboards, Bali grabbed the mic. <laughs> and I grabbed a keyboard because uh, obviously I, I I was playing at home a bit, but so I'll jump on the keyboard here. And we just had a little jam for about 15, 20 minutes. You know, we were we were terrible, but you know, at those days we just wanted to, you know, imitate the the other bands out there, like I just mentioned. And um, and then one of the teachers came in, and go, and, you know, and she was going, like, if you want to, you know, do this, you know, you know, we can just have a bit of a jam if you want to do something different. And we go, yeah, we want to do a uh, Indian um, uh, Indian track, and uh, so we played her the, her the track that we wanted to do, and she helped us um, learn it to a certain degree. Like you know, oh, this is what's being played here, and she was actually actually she was she was a violinist, 
Uh, um, Miss McAllister or something like that. So we all, and, we all, we all heard everything, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it, it was, it was by pure chance. This was like we just ended up in the music room, and um, and it was just something that we were all kind of in. obviously we we like uh, budget and his kids. They had all these instruments right, lying around at their houses, so they were into a little bit of the music as well. So mm. it was just nice, you know, just, well, just complete jag pals, probably you know, Jackson Five, that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, but, yeah. and um, I see that picture. There is a picture. Oh, there and is. You're all wearing green outfits. Is that the one? Uh, light blue. Yeah, light, awesome. yeah, light yeah. blue with white trousers. You know, for you know, for the for the podcast, I'm gonna actually stick that picture, and I'm gonna get it. Oh, I'll stick it in there. It's oh, it's it's only only a few people have got it, but I'm sure it's been circulated. It's had it has been circulated on Facebook or something. <laughs> yeah, but as I say, yeah. So that's how we actually, uh, you know, we sort of got into music in on on that aspect, and then um, we were asked to perform at our assembly, and so this has never been done in the you know uh, anywhere because uh, we went to um, George Dixon, and. Um, and all the activities, uh, like any acts, it was either the Gore doing an act or the Kali doing some kind of reggae kind of music kind of mm. vibe. And no one had done um, Punjabi music as, as, as you know, I think I, I think for assembly. And like we were shitting ourselves, you know what I mean? Like, yo, you know, bass heels in here. And, um, <laughs> but, and um, so, you know, assembly was, you know, everyday kind of thing. So on the last day, on the Friday, we they've announced that oh, we've got a new act today. It's, 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 and we actually, yeah, the name of the band. It was called Kalakar. No laughing. All right. <laughs> it just it was called Kalakar. And I was like, I don't know who came with that name, but uh, we we stuck with that name. And so the teachers, you know, one head, headmaster and other, and now on stage we've got a new band called Kalakar, which are from the the lads from within the school. Mm. And so we've Curtain's gone back. We started our tune, you know, uh, whatever. And we sang um he does um uh oh gosh, what was it, man? Uh, yes, sorry, you're bang on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was uh yeah, Akadeshare and we two songs uh, mm. and we've got the video. And, you, and no, you, you're not. You're not getting that. No, no, uh, no. Yeah, I was gonna. Not, I was gonna tell you. I know. I know. I know. And there's, there's a couple. But I, I tell you. I tell you. We sounded. Bali was singing. I was on the keys. Jets on the congos. Raj on the on the keyboards. And we've we've done our performance. And it's we're singing off key. You know, yeah. because we didn't know anything about bloody. Uh, you know, sort of key party. So Bali was singing off on a different key. But we look good. <laughs> That's about it. We look good. Um, but it was appreciated by everyone in in assembly because they had never seen, or heard, sorry, heard Punjabi music being performed yeah. in a school. And so we were like, after the after that performance, we were like, like mini mini pop stars. Yo, these guys are, um, you know, young a young band from from George Dixon. And from there, actually, we went to other schools to perform because uh, word got around in in the Birmingham area and we even did one in a girls school in uh, London where they um, had booked us to actually perform there for you know uh, 15 20 minutes so, and so um, we, we you know we were a, a, uh, the first Asian probably band school band to go around to other schools to just to perform a, a couple of tracks uh, but so that's how we really uh, you know going to and it was a uh, and we even did a couple of parties uh, I remember my um Masi the Munda, you know, um, they had a baby boy, and we ended up performing at the Farcroft oh. for about for about half an hour, and we you know covered quite a variety of tracks, and that video you're not going to get as well. <laughs> well, uh, I'm just going to pause you right there because if you look at this camera, oh, you got it, you got it. <laughs> oh shit, oh shit, <laughs> oh gosh, I hate the eyes, I hate social media. <laughs> yeah, gosh, yes, that's the no. one, that's the one, <laughs> but. <laughs> The ultimate goal would be if you got the video. No, I ain't getting that, man. Uh, just, just, nah, the, no, the, the, the worst thing, I have got it right here on my um, on my uh, laptop, I'm a, I'm a, on my PC. Uh, well, you, got, you know what it is? It's some of that where you have to upload it for the next gen to see it. You know what I mean? It's going to be... Uh, uh, no, it, it, no, personally, it, it, I'm, I'm not even, you know, it's... it's, it's when, you look, when, I, when I look back at it, it's, it's, it's hilarious to me. I'm going, yo, that yeah. was... It was, it was, you know, we weren't the best of performance, but it was fun as well because, you know, we we, we had the whole thing like you know, on the picture you had there. And then we uh, we actually uh, actually ended up doing a performance in the evening 
where actually Bajan had his band, uh, I think it was Malab Group, that performed at GD uh, as a um, a family function in the evening, and it was sold out. And um, so, so we went on first as just a, as just a warm up act and mm. um, performed about two two three tracks, and then uh, Bajan Lima came on with his band. And it, it was it was a you know good vibe. I've, even I've got that video as well, which is, and it was everyone's on the dance floor in a school hall back in those days, and it was just everyone's having a good time. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that was the vibe back in the days, though. Um, even like the you know the unknown bands were fully booked out, and um, the vibe was positive. Yeah, so that's how we sort of our foundation started on um, from school, um, getting into music. To... So they, there's a there's a message there, kids. So make sure. You know, if you you attend music classes at school, you, you might actually become, you know, a future Hall of Famer. No, yeah, but I, personally, I wish I wish I had taken up um, the subject of music at school. So uh, hang on, you didn't even take up music at school? No, no. So that, what I've just said is just a waste of time, then, yeah? <laughs> no, 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 that's what, no, that's what, when you said it, I'm going, oh, you're making sure. That, that's the worst thing about it. I didn't even take up music at school. Uh, I don't know for what reason. Um, so yeah, that's sometimes you know it, I get bewil- uh, bewildered. Like, how did I not do music at school? Mm. Uh, no, at the same time, I wasn't really into um, English music. I was more into the Punjabi music. I mean, obviously, back in those days, they were just teaching English um, music. They weren't teaching nothing like. Um... So at that time, what was what were you listening to? Let, let, just to give it a bit of time frame, because the reason I want to say this, I, I just to get this bit is from the moment where you leave your school, the next sort of five years are arguably some of the biggest years in UK Pongra life. So I want to I want, I want to get the ages correct on this. And I want you to lead this part oh, of the story. That might be difficult because I, you know, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you don't remember, you can't, uh, you can't blame me. Yeah, yeah no, no. I mean, uh, at school, I think we was around about 13, 14. Okay. We started um, doing this kind of, Thing at school, and um, I was also in the we had a Pangra team as well, okay. Um, and I was part of that as well, which was um, it was brilliant because we were actually, to be honest, we were showing the Gori and the Kale about our culture at school. Where you know, obviously, we, we knew about reggae music, we knew about rap and hip hop, uh, but the Gori and Kale didn't know about Punjabi music, and so it was, and and, and they appreciated it, like you know, when we did perform, they all. Okay, because so, they've never seen like a toll or a tolki before. And um, so bringing that to them, especially when, when we did um, our panga dancing, obviously with the toll, you know, it's probably the loudest instrument out there. Mm. Um, and they were just taken back. Yo, that one little drum is making all that noise. And um, so, um, yeah, so that was around about 13 or 14 that we um, did that. Um, and then I think I was introduced to Satrang. Uh, around about 15 16 i believe Fifth, okay so i want everyone to everyone to just hold it here yeah <laughs> so think about a 15 16 year old that you have in your family your own kids or anything what they could they could barely wash the dishes or whatever right and you're entering the studios and in brand, like band rehearsals like, or just being part of the band of of satrang so now here, here is a bit of admission from me. So yesterday we did meet, by the way, in a we function. Did. Yeah, we did. And um, I was asking a question around uh, legends or pongra, pongra muffin, right? Uh, and we were, I was trying to work out when, what was released first, or what did you work on first? And I'm trying to track things down, but because of how things are uploading, that you just can't. Do it. I've lost my collection. I'll be honest. Yeah. So uh, okay. I'm going to ask you the question: What were your first recordings? <laughs> My first recordings. Um, the first recording was um, Tola with Tola uh, with Satrang. Um, and we actually, the, the band actually gave me and Tobzi some time at the studio. This is back in the day, about 1987 or 88-ish. 88. Um, so I'm, just to rub it, I'm six. Okay. That, that uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, they gave us some time at the studio in Warsaw. And I think Tubsy's made his way down from um, college uh, to get there. I've got dropped off there somehow. And we've got about three, four hours of studio time booked. Just to, just to and, and like being at that age as well is like, yo, 
wicked. We're in a studio and we ain't got a clue what to do. But, you know, the engineer's there with us. And we go, okay, we got this track. Um, we just want to do a little quick demo. And um, so um, I think I started um, playing some pieces on the keyboard and the recording onto the computer. Um, sat down with Tubbsy, obviously, and just go through verse music, verse music, that kind of stuff. Um, and we've we've knocked out in four hours, like a, a guide uh, to a dollar, a dollar. <laughs> that version was good, actually. It was, it was, it was neither me and Tubbsy were really, you know, proud of it. Like, yo, this sounds good, you know, this sounds good. Um, and then we've started, and then at the same time, we had the song Barnagadi um with uh with Satarong. and um we've we've started and then we've had the demo from this uh, studio in warsaw it's called jk studios mm. in uh warsaw and um, so we've done that demo and, and it sounded good and then the manager of the band um jazz gill um he decided to get it done properly in a proper studio and so not, not a proper studio i mean a different studio and the one that we chose was mix and clear studio in handsworth uh, yeah, and road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so we've gone down um, mixing Claire Studio, and we put down the track "Dollar by Dollar." And obviously, Tobzy did a dangerous um, performance on that. You know, it's, arguably it's, the best Dolgi piece. No, it's like it's the it's most recognized. Recognized you, 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 you play piece. that anywhere, you know what's coming. Yeah, you know what's coming. Yeah, you know you, what's you know, coming. You, you and he actually, I had him on the podcast, and he actually did that piece on there. He actually, I know, and, and, and no, it's, it's very rarely that you hear a Tolki solo and people know what's going to come next. Yeah. It's always a music piece or something, but to stand out from the crowd, you know, a Tolki, a Tolki, you know, starting, and everyone knows what's gonna what's gonna come next. Uh, so he. I, I, I was gonna say the most recognised me. Then I remember quickly. Good and he gets just looped everywhere. So he does it all. No, no. I mean, obviously, yeah. But when you hear that thought at the beginning, oh yeah, you know that. And you go, that, yeah, we know what's coming now. And so we we've done that. And um, so this is about I'm about sixteen, seventeen now. And also we um, sorry at JK Studio we did a version of um, Farnagadi as well. Um. Because because we were just given um, allocated time just to do have a quick work on these two tracks, see what I could come up with. Um, so we've done both those tracks. Then we decided to do it properly, and so obviously we're going to end the studio. Don't do love it, do love it, do love. Then we started on Panagale. Um, same time, due to the fact that I was one of the younger members of the band, and the other uh, musicians were you know same professionals, um, the way they were doing uh, Panagale was was to me wasn't right. It was like, you know, it, it's a it's a banging song, but the way we're doing it now, it's it's not right. Because they were sort of working on a bit of a more um, modern English feel to it, uh, where I'm going, no, this needs to be a bit more desi, and um, you know, it's quite similar to dollar by dollar, but they were adamant that that's the way they want to do it, and so. Um, we they started that and it was taking too long at the studio to finish off two tracks. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously, all love, all love was done, um, but Barnagal it was just taking forever to do to get it right. Um, and so I saw so me, it took around about three or four months. And so at that time, I decided, you know, I, I need to move on because you know, it's it's, it's you know, the, the tracks are fine. And so I actually left, um, me and the guitarist, um, Raj. Actually left South Rung around about um, nineteen eighty nine, uh, and that's when I got introduced to Suffrey. Okay, Sorry. <laughs> so, so Suffrey's another chapter, right? Wait yeah. there, wait there. I want to go back. I need to get you go this. back. So you're, you're six. So I just want to get this in cut. You're sixteen years old. Unbelievable. You're the youngest one. One of the youngest one there. I'm, I'm guessing Tubbsy's around about. The same, yeah, same age. Same right. age. And yeah, you're 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 trying to dictate the culture in terms of the in, in terms of the band. Obviously, that's gonna you know ruffle. Ah, Monday. What what are these kids are trying to tell us how to play yes. and all this, right? Yeah. Um, two two things. Um, one was how difficult it was it to get your opinions across because obviously, ultimately, it left it made the decision for you to leave. 
And the second one is more of a studio one from a production point of view. The sound on that particular song is it, so distinct in the way. Did it sound the same when you moved to studio, or does or does that make from a lay from a layman's person? Does that make a difference? Because I I don't know that bit. No, I mean that. the one the one that we did at uh, JK Studios first. It was a rough demo, but it did sound good. Um, That's still around anyway. You know something? It's it's it is, it is probably around somewhere in one of my eight boxes of cassettes, and you know I've got around about two thousand in each box, so um, it would be nice to find it because that was a very um, it was very similar but different. Um, I mean the sound why I mean I, I, I something it was a because at, at at the end we were really happy with the one that we did at um, Mix and Claire's and Road. Um, as I said, the one that we did at JK Studios. It was just a demo version of what we trying to go for, and that's what I mean because um, that the Barnaga that that we did um, at JK Studios that got leaked. And they used to leak it back then. Yeah, it got leaked back. It got leaked back in the day, and everyone had it, and they go, "Yo, this is a killer track." And because we we hadn't done all that then, the first one that we actually did was a the demo of. Um, Barnagade and that actually got leaked out of out of out of both of those Tola Tola and uh Barnagade. Barnagade got leaked and half of Smedic had it. <laughs> so <laughs> that means that means all of Smedic. <laughs> yeah, I know as we because uh, and we, still to to this day we don't know how it got leaked. Um but wow. people were uh, there, there was a buzz around at that time. Yo, this is this gonna be a, a killer track. And th- so that was the version that we did at JK Studios. Um yeah, so as I said, um, left Satrang midway through their first... Uh... Just at this point. You know, so one of my favourite songs at that time is Gartaro. And the way that's yeah. kind of... The way that's been produced, was it around about the same time or like... No, no, I, 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 no, no I had left before that. I had left before that. So I, I had nothing to do with um, Gartaro, nothing whatsoever. But as you mentioned it, that was a sick track. Yeah. Sick track. I, I'll take, take my hats off to Tubbsy for the percussion on that um, sick track. Mm. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because obviously, the, from a sound point of view, it, it sounds like it sounds amazing as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh definitely. No, it, that was a that, that is probably one of my favorite tracks from Satrang is uh, Cartaro. Uh, the way it's the way the way they did that is banging, banging. Can't dispute that one. So. We're gonna go on, and it's so poignant with you know with Belinda Safri's year, um, yeah, you know of his passing, and it just it's a moment that we kind of reflect back. So the timing for this is, I think you're one of the best people to kind of comment on this oh. journey because it's so synonymous with with everybody. Uh, okay, well, well, so okay. The point was, I had just we had just left um, Satrang. And then uh, one of our uh, mates, H, who uh, plays Dobla, he's contact contacted myself and uh, Raj, the guitarist, uh, to say, listen, there's a guy, um, he needs some musicians to uh, perform with him. And I go, okay, where? Where's his, where's his performance? And he goes, oh, it's, it's at the Dome. And like, obviously, back in those days, the Dome was like the mecca of Bhangra music. If you've performed at the Dome, you've done it. You know what I mean? You, you've, you've hit that benchmark. Like, I'm at the Dome. And I'll go, yo, yo, I'm I'm there. I'm there. You know what I mean? Just, yes, tell this geezer. Yeah, I go, who is he? He goes, oh, his name's Blowing the Suffrey. Never heard of him. Never heard of him. And funny enough, we had rehearsal at Mix and Claire Studio uh, and Road. And um, so I've never met Suffrey prior to this. And I've never heard of him. Um, so we, uh, me and the guitarist have turned up at a rehearsal and he's got two um, musicians with him anyway. Um, Happy was already with him and the, uh, we had another keyboard player, uh, Taj. And so he had two musicians there and then myself, Raj and H on the doubler. And uh, he had just released at that time an album called Reflections. And so he wanted to do um, two numbers from that album to perform at the dome and so he's played us the track uh and uh i can't remember the other one 
Diddy Thor, I believe, something like that. Yeah, Diddy Yeah, Thor, I think there's footage of that, actually. Yeah. And uh, so we've um, rehearsed that. And uh, obviously, you can't be, you know, you can sort everything out with the uh, musicians, you know, get to you know, get to navy, you know. Oh, like, yeah, I'll, 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 you know, I can do that. We've done the show at the um, dome, it's gone down like a storm. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, he's contacted me. He goes, Listen, can I, you know, have a sit down with you? I go, yeah, no problem. So, and those days I, I I didn't drive, so he's picked me up, and he's taking me to the uh, the vine in West Brom. <laughs> Still there, yeah. Yeah, no, that's for me. That's for me. He, he's taking me to the vine uh, in in West Brom. We've ordered like a mixed grill or something, and he, he just started chatting. Go, listen, you know, I I think I could do with someone like yourself to uh, work with. He goes, I'm sure we can do something together. Um, and you know, he he was speaking, he was speaking right from the heart. And I, I could see, you know, in his voice and, you know, in the way he, the way he approached, he was really from the heart. And um, and even at that time, I was um, uh, being approached by other bands to join them um, as a keyboard player. Um, but these other bands, I won't mention it, but, you know, they were they were more established bands um, than Garvey Stuffy was just new on the market. And so I, I was being approached by these established bands to join them. But at the same time, I didn't really want to join these bands because it would have been their kind of show. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would just be the keyboard player then and, you know, it wouldn't really affect me. And so that's why I did make the decision of, okay, I get, I said, okay, listen, we'll, we'll try and do something together then. And so that's how we sort of ended up. No, I, and, even before that, when we had rehearsal the first time with Sufri, he started singing. And in my head, I'm going, yo, this guy is he's a good, he's a good fucking singer, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, I go, yeah. In my head, I'm like, I'm, I'm surprised no one's actually got hold of him because he's he's on a, you know, he's he's a good yeah, singer. Yeah. And that's at that time, I just thought he was just a good singer. At that at that age, I didn't realize how good he was as a singer, you know, that he'd been taught classically and you know he knew all his rags and every the whole shebang and he was on a next level and i didn't realize i just thought yo he's a good singer that's it full stop nothing nothing you know nothing more nothing less and uh, so yeah we're at the vine he's gone you know what i want you know i'm sure we could do something together and so and so as soon as that happened is your mic gone off yeah, yeah, I'll just cough in there. I was trying to oh, be and not and stop the story, but I've stopped it now. Go on. <laughs> and so he's and so we so we're chatting away, and then so I agreed to do something together. And at the same time, I was just in my back mind, I had Barnagade. Uh, because he was a cover version anyway. I did actually ask um Slim, the singer from Satrang. And because he, he was like an older, older brother to me, Slim was back uh, when we was in Satrang. He always used to look after me, you know, and, you know, keep me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> and um, so I asked him, I go, Slim, listen, um, is it all right if I do Barnagade with this next person? Because the way Satrang are doing it, um, the way they've done it now, it's, 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 it's not right, it's wrong. It's the song, it's, it's, it's a killer song, but we do, we're doing your wrong. He goes, listen, just carry on where we going to do. He goes, he goes, and he was quite cheesed off anyway with the band at the time because he was taking too long. He goes, yeah, yeah, if you want to do it, just do it. No problem. I said, brilliant. Funny enough, if he had said, no, don't do it, it wouldn't have happened. Okay. It, it, it wouldn't have happened. So, um, so I've asked him and then I've come back to Sophia. I go, Sophia, um, I've got a song for you if you want to um, go for it. And he was like, yeah, whatever you say, you know, we'll do it. Whatever. I go, okay, listen, this is a song. Um, and he'd heard of it, but you know, obviously because he he, he was from back from Punjab, and so he's there. He goes, yeah, I'll do it. Go and um, so I at the same time I knew that Satrang had are doing this song anyway. But um, working with Safri, like, so we've gone to uh, a studio in Bridge North. It was something Rabbit Touch or White Rabbit, something like that, up um, Paul Hodgson Studio. And this is around about 1989, stroke 90 ish, something yeah, around about that time. And obviously, um, Sufri had worked um, with Hajinda Boparai 
um, with the reflections and uh, with and with Deepak Janchi. And so Ajinda Bop Roy was brought on because obviously I didn't have much experience in um, studios. Mm -hmm. So um, Ajinda Bop Roy was there as well. And um, so I presented the song. We got um, the the foundations laid out, you know, what's happening here, what's happening there, what's happening here. Uh, dropped a couple of samples. And we actually did, ended up doing that track in about three to four days wow. from, from start to finish. So you're about eight, nine, 19 at this? Um, about 18. 18. 18. <laughs> yeah, 18. Oh, my. Oh, no, you, well, let me see. 17. 17. 17. 17? Yeah, 17. Are we going for 17? Yeah. 17 years old. Wow. Yeah, yeah, at 17. No, no but, but you, we don't... I, these were the first two tracks that um, I actually produced. So, they, you know, they meant a lot. Mm. And the way we, obviously, myself and Tubsy had left um, the version with Satan Tola Tola, it was perfect. Because I remember, at the, uh, so we've done like Panagadi and then Safri's manager at the time, he goes, um, listen, let's do Tola Tola as well. And I go, well, I, I can't really beat the version that we've already done. Um, and it's no point just copying it, you know. It'll be exact. It'll be identical, you know, almost identical. And I go, that that version is perfect. I go, I wouldn't touch that with anything. But Barnagar, they go, we we can do, and like with Barnagar, they so free. He he was wicked to in the sense like he gave me free reign. He goes, Jo Marjikar. He goes, you can do whatever you want to. And I'll go, okay, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this, like. Um, if you hear the Satrang version, there's no shared at the beginning. Um, and I and that's where I'm going where, where when I did that, you know, there's about eight bar gap. I go, and I just turned to because Sophia take us try that. Whatever, can you do something? When I share you know, and he goes, and he's looked at me, go, listen, I know exactly what you want. I go, okay. And he just went in the studio and he dropped it. And probably it was probably the first take. And he just dropped it. I was there, just amazed, going, perfect, man. <laughs> oh, man. But, and set the other, and, and uh, that, no, that's what I mean. He was, he, he knew exactly what I wanted um, and just fit it like a glove. And, and so I got Jamalaya on that, you know, at the share at the beginning. I goes, hey, that we stick another one in the halfway, halfway through the track. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, Karte, go again. I go drop something else in the middle and he dropped it again. I'm going, yo, perfect. That's perfect. And uh, at the same time, now, every time you hear the starting of Farnagada, you know what's yeah. coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's the same with Tola Tola. You went to hear that, the, the Tolki start, you know what's coming. So both those tracks, and I think it was 92 um, at the Pop Awards, um, where... Um, that uh, there was a category where best single and Satrang won it for Tola Tola yeah. and Sufri won it for Legends. Um, and so you were pretty smug, <laughs> no, no, I know, I know, I know, because at the time I go, Yo, this is funny. And they were announced to go, the, uh, the, you know, I think it was uh, Cash from Radio Derby. He announced to go, Yeah, this used to be one band at, uh, at one stage. And so it was, you know, it was, it was brilliant though. Like uh, Satrang won it for Tola Tola and Safri took it. And it was a joint award. But so, but, but they gave us two um, awards, like one from Satrang, one from that. But it was me and Tubbs had a nice little cheeky little grin on our face. So, yo, we worked on both of these things. That's our, that's our little babies, you know what I mean? And so that was, and especially at that age, um, we were like, yo, we're at the dome. We're getting bloody um, um, awards for work that we've done and you know this is um you know beyond our one of our you know some of our wildest wildest dreams out there and so we were on a high and so as soon as we finished recording you know legends and released it overnight suffering sort of been introduced onto onto the map and um we've started getting bookings you know left right and center and so suffering again has now approached me to say yo if that got there let's work on an album now and I go, Safi, yeah, yeah, brilliant, man. And he goes, I go, I've got a couple of songs if you want to do them. And uh, so obviously one was uh, Jat Hirjindore, 
and the other one was um, Kamali. I go, ah, do gaane pila kar de. He goes, kar. And again, it was so flexible. He goes, listen, to jo marji kar. You know, I don't give a shit what you do. You just, you, you just, you just, you know, I know that you know, you got <clears> something <throat> about you that you know what what's gonna work out there. And he goes, you just, you just tell me to, you know, however you want to do it, I'll, I'll get it done. And so when we started working Bomba Tumbi, just um, about a month before, I think, um, Ajanik released um, one of their albums, I think it was uh, Signature or something. And the sound quality on that album, I, I really enjoyed. I wasn't, a, I wasn't a huge fan of Ajanik back in the day, but when they released that album, the sound quality was on a sort of a next level. And so I did approach something, I listen, find out where they've recorded that album because I, I want to record at that place because it's nice and clean sound they've got in there. And obviously he's got back to me um, and um, he goes, that was done at a famous recording studio, which is based in Bromsgrove. And the engineer was Pete Ware. And I go, Sofri Otiana. And he's come back to me, go, Yara, menga water. I'm going, Guinea, he goes, he goes, they're charging about 45 pounds an hour. Where normal other studios, um, say say place like Mix and Claire's, were charging about fifteen pound an hour, and so you know it was a virtually you know treble the amount. Um, he goes menga water. I go but Sophie look, equity card they, and so he obviously has gone back to because we he had signed up with a Roma Music Bank, mm. and so he had gone back to prepare and obviously had had a discussion and then he's gone back to me goes. I got the book in. Let's let's get down to bloody Brom's and start recording this bloody fucking album. And um, and we've turned up at um, me and Sophie have turned up at um, the studio, and it's it's a house. <laughs> it's a house, and we think it was going to be a big, you know, massive big setup. It it was a house in Bromsgrove, and uh, but it was all you know properly done, like a studio. I think the owners were someone called Terry and Susie. Yeah. They were the owners. And Pete Ware used to work as the engineer for the studio. And But I was surprised it was a house because obviously, you know, you go to other You see studios. it, you vision it in your head and it's just completely yeah. different. Yeah, yeah, that's something, it was absolutely completely different. And um, so it was a house. Like, and I was, first thing I go, I asked the, uh, Pete Ware, I go, so did a child record their album here? He goes, yeah. I go, Okay, you know, and because it, it was show me, show me. No, I, I was saying, I'm yeah, trying to record. He goes, yeah. I go, okay, safe. You know, let's okay. Let, let, you know, so how we how we so um I I when I interviewed Sadara, he was talking about how they used to just record in one room and and uh, have all the the artists there and have different layer tracks. Yeah. How did did your style of recording change, especially when uh, you went into like? I'm guessing that might be a bit uh, intimidating going to a studio like that. And but no, what were you used to recording? No, the- I mean, um, so, so think about it. Um, I, I haven't had that much experience in studios. Uh, I was the first one was JK Studio, then went to um, Mix and Clear Studio. So that's two studios I've just worked in for not long, and then now I'm going to a third studio, uh, famous, and this is completely different from what what I thought from, um, and we were. Like if you if you're in a place like India, they record quite a few musicians at one time. Like all the percussion that you know, you know tol, tabla, tol, ki, they probably record that all in one go. But we were doing it completely different in in the UK. We were doing it more of a, the way the um, English artists do it. You know, one by one going uh, to a certain degree. Like Tubbsy was 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 recorded by himself, and on on all the percussion, the guitarist he came in and recorded his parts as well. Uh, but obviously, if we we're in place like India, that would have been all all musicians in one room, a couple of mics des- designated around the room to to get the ambience feel and uh, certain the main instruments like Dolky Pabla and that, that kind of stuff. But we were it, we, we never recorded. It was always a solo performance from every uh, musician that played part of, of making a recording for Bomba Um Yeah, it wasn't. It was never. A couple of musicians in the one room together is all uh, done separately, uh, which which obviously you get a better, cleaner sound and you get uh, better separation um, from tracks. They 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 don't get overspill. 
mm. from other instruments. Yeah, so we were sort of taught that the English way of recording, um, which obviously does make sense. Um, if you need to turn something up, uh, you can't really turn it up from the main track. But if you've got the individual uh, instrument playing on a solo track, you can EQ to your like. Yeah, if it's all re- recorded together, you got to e- you can't EQ the dark or the double uh, to a certain frequency because you're gonna EQ the whole mix of it. Yeah, so so you, you're you're recording the album there. What was that experience like? Then did you record it in a short amount of time because of it, or was it more complex? Um, no, it was. It, to be honest with you, it, it's handy having a good engineer uh, in the first place, um, and. Pete Ware, uh, I, I take my hat off for him. I uh, I learned a lot from uh, Pete Ware because obviously I wasn't actually um, doing the programming um, into the um, you know uh, computers, but because those days we used to record on um, uh, Atari STs, black and white. Wow! Atari and I still, I, still, I still got it. I still got it. I still got it. And I. I I'm not gonna lie. I did pull it out last week. I was transferring some stuff over. Do you know how slow it is? I swear to God, you want to split your throat. I saw a big 500, man. Now this is black and white. Yeah, and I don't, I don't it's, slow as it <laughs> it's slow as fuck. It's slow as fuck. And oh gosh, and I and I look back, I go, I can't believe I produced some of my songs on this system. And it was those that because um, these systems that send the modern systems now, you can record anything onto them now, all audio and everything. Back in those days, the computer was just for MIDI stuff, and that was just so it was no audio whatsoever. This was just the foundation for the track, the MIDI, the, the complete MIDI section. And so I've still got all of Suffrage's collection from Bomber Thumbi and Elvi Mess. Wow, still on MIDI. Wow. and. I have converted the whole of Bomber Thumbi onto the latest um, uh, digital audio workstation I'm, I'm using. And it was fun transferring it over. It brought back a lot, a lot of memories where <laughs> I'm going, I can't believe I've produced this kind of stuff. And as I was saying, um, I learned a lot from Pete Ware uh, just to see. And, and he actually did teach me how to uh, program um, on the Atari because um, I got Pete listening. You know, I need to learn this kind of stuff. So, is alright if I watch you carefully and if you know could explain to me what you're actually doing, um, so I could get into my thick head that yeah. this is what you know. This is all, so. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. This is how you do that. And so we did that album. I think within two to three months from start to finish. Um, which was quick, not because at the same time Pete was quite busy because uh, his studio was booked out, so we was having uh, not difficulty trying to um, book the studio because he was everyone wanted that kind of sound, so he was quite busy, and so we had to book you know within a couple of weeks in, in advance. Yo, we need to have these days. Have did you have a, Did you have a deadline? Like um, what I'm saying is like, was it you had to get ready for like wedding season or something like that? No, no, actually, no. That's uh, it wasn't. It was like. I wasn't going to release it until I was 100% happy with it. And um, we, because I, at the same time, I had all the ideas because I used to have a little scrapbook and everything. I was write down all my ideas and this is what I want to do on this song, or this one I do on this song. So in my head, I, I had the vision like, this is, the ha- this is how I want it to sound. It needs to be sound like this, it needs to be like this. And so at the same time, I mean, I was learning how to create that sound by watching Pete Ware. So I would play in like um, the drum pattern on the keyboard, um, you know, just, um, like using a, a drum kit on the keyboard. And then he would quantize it for me, obviously, because you know, I'm just playing on the keyboard. And so he would just quantize it. And I would go, so what are you doing there? You go, oh, that's quantizing, you know, to give you a bit of a swing. That kind of thing. Oh, okay, cool, wicked. That's, so that's how you do that. That's how you do that. And so I was, same time, I was like really eager to learn as well because I wanted to do, do music anyway. So I was eager to learn. And um, so he did help me a lot. And the first track we actually, I remember we did was Jat um, Hejan And um, this is how good Pete was. He's like, um, so we've done the um, 
the mix and I've gone, Pete, you know something? I think the bass needs turn, you know, needs turning up. And he goes, he goes, really? I go, I think he does, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling it. He goes, I think the bass is just perfect. You know, it's, it's, um, it's fine. I go, now if you could do me one more mix um, and just turn the bass up a bit. And so we've played it through and he goes, is, is the bass okay for you now? I go, that's perfect now. I'm happy with that. And so he goes, he goes, but to me, it's too loud. I go, but to me, it sounds perfect. So I go, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go with your version. And so we had a gig in, uh, uh, in the evening at Pagoda Park in Birmingham. Mm. And I was a big deal to smile. I go, you know, I'm going to drop a new track today. It's just a demo just to show people, you know, this is going to be coming out soon. And so the DJs played it. And he just goes, I've got too much fucking bass on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got too many. You can't work out what the fuck is happening on the track. <laughs> and because I remember the next day we were back in the studio again. Because you go, yeah, you're right, you're right. You know, that's it was exactly what I go, Pete, you're right, mate. He goes, you so. he goes what, what do you mean? I go, I tried it, I tried it last night. He goes, just too much fucking bass on it. He goes, your version was right. He goes, he goes, he goes, yeah, you, you'll you'll learn that as you're going along. So that you know that, that was good like that. Um, as I said, yeah, yeah, Bomber Thumbi took us around about three three months from start to finish to so basically it was about two tracks a month. Um, but that was it, it would have been done probably faster if we had more if we had block booked the studio out in advance but obviously they, they were quite busy as well oh. and yes so um, <laughs> as I say it's like Bomba Thumbi the last track no so we did um, Mirza first second was Kamali uh, Sajna Arjave uh, then we did the Bolia and the last track was probably Tornagara. But it was, and same time, because if you remember the early, very early 90s, late 80s, it was, Bolnia used to be always last track on the album. Everyone used to. And so that was only when I decided to go, Safriya Dagar there, we'll stick the Bolnia on first. And again, Safriya, you saw, you go, Tu Marji Ho, Jo Marji Kar. Then the Kulu should be a go, yeah. Well, we'll stick the bully on first, see how you know, fuck it, the dub there, we'll stick it on first. And um, so we dropped it as exactly like that, you know, bully the opening track of the album. And with you know, overnight it was just a huge success. Uh, which even we, I was happy with it because, as I said, I wouldn't have released it if it, I wasn't 100% happy with it. I was over the moon, and at the same time, I think. Safri did an amazing job. Um, vocally, he damaged, he actually killed the album because w- with all his knowledge and everything, he, I would ask him to do anything in the studio and he would just deliver. Um, and, and live, the way he used to perform live as well was just, it used to sound exactly like the tape. Eight, no, the, the, that was the old because those days we didn't use many samples or that kind of stuff. It was, mm. and the way I wanted to do the music, we, we need to do the music so we can replicate back on stage. Um, yeah, obviously, you can use like you know loops and that kind of stuff, but I was more into yo because other bands, all the all the bands would it would it would be normally a band effort where they would the whole band would record the album, um, uh, due to the fact that uh, most of our band members had um day jobs as well they couldn't actually um get time to come to the studio the way you were you were still technically at college so you dropped I was... Bob Tumbi at the age of 18 yeah yeah I'm not because I remember um stuff used to come and pick me up from I used to go to Wensbury College uh, college so he used to come and pick me up from Wensbury College to take me to uh, famous uh studios in Bronze Grove so and it was, you know 10 o'clock in the morning go met him Saturday Nova Chakunga the R I go just come in the canteen and we'll go from there and so he, he just picked me up and we spent, you know, uh, our cutoff time would be normally around about seven in the evening. So we used to do a good, you know, eight, nine hour shift at um, the studio. And it would take us virtually about three to four days to finish off one track. Want to get the, you know, the track the way we want it and then bringing in musicians to um, do their parts. You know, people like Tubsy, Raj, uh, Dear Raj to you know coming down you know because he played um El Gorge for us uh on Dorna Gara so you know we get people in and you like people like um Sakshinda Shinda to play um uh, on uh, certain tracks of the album 
but at the same time we were we were happy with the album um, but at the same time we didn't know how well it would do we go I, I got something the album's good and that was it I go it's a good it's a good album <laughs> but uh, as soon as we released it we you know uh, even we were were taken back like how well it did um, because to be honest with you at that time um, um, there was another EP out um, Overdrive by Galavant Pomera and um, Cam Frantic and they on that album they had the two tracks that we did on Bombatumbi they had uh, Mirza and uh, Kamali by coincidence um, or just yeah no yeah coincidence it wasn't like um, they knew that we were doing it we knew they were doing it and when once I heard um, uh, Overdrive I was gutted because I liked that version that they did mm. And the way that the camp produced that one, I was, I go, oh shit, man, I like that version. They're gonna, they're gonna, you know, it's gonna, they're gonna piss over my version. Mm. Uh, and I, I did, I'll be honest with you, I did like that version. But I think what clinched it for us, it was more vocal what Suffrage delivered on it. Um, yeah, and again, he was uh, too good. And what was the reaction of the other bands there? Because like you guys are a young upper, you come onto the scene. You've absolutely you've you've blown everyone away just you know with the, with the release of Bomb the Thumbie. What was the kind of what was the reaction? Um, I mean, okay, now think about it. we've dropped um, Legends, and that's been a big success for us. And and obviously people are expecting what they're gonna do next, and then for us to drop Bomb the Thumbie and see that yo, it's done better than we anticipated uh, to the sense like to us it was a good album that was it but the way the people took to it um even we even we were taken back as as the band um but same time it never got to our heads we were just loving it because we were we were a young band um and we were you know all, all, overnight is everyone's talking about the Suffrage boys the Suffrage boys you know and then we just, you know, realized that all of a sudden our bookings have doubled. Um, where every, and then at the same time, we used to rehearse a lot as well to make sure that we could, you know, replicate what we've done on the cassette. And we used to have two rehearsals a week wow. uh, to get our set. Because, as I said, back in those days, it was um, every band wanted to do better than the other band. Not in a malicious way, but in a more of a healthy competition way, where you know we want to shine on this gig, we want to shine. We, well, obviously, every band wants to shine on every gig, but we go, we we've got to make sure our performance is on par with the rest of the bands, and we want to, you know, stand out. But I think the the one the one I was uh, every band has a, like a, some kind of secret weapon, and I was a secret weapon. Ours was Suffrey has a front man. He was he was as I said on a, on a on a different level, and he he could deliver whatever you wanted, Hindi, Punjabi, obviously not English, but you know, Kowali. He, he was just too good, and even like um, re- recently, obviously uh, by uh, by his passing, um, even Malkit said that you know back in those days, uh, Safri was his only competition um, when we started, and we used to have so many. Gigs where it used to be Suffrey Boys versus Malkit Singh, mm-hmm. and um, you know, they used to have the pictures of both of their faces and uh, with boxing gloves on, <laughs> um, you know, to make like you know, this is a this yeah. is a fight happening here, mate, you know, this is serious business. And um, but it was fun because the bands would actually make an effort to think of something to do, uh, on the event, not just turn up and just perform and go home. Yeah, let's put on a proper bloody you know damn form. So we had, we even hired a um, a like a manager for the day, uh, who's a guy called Brian Thornycroft. Um, he's, I used to work at Amazon City back in the day, so we booked him because we had quite a few things that happened that day because it it was you know it was meant to be like a proper grudge match of monkeys mm. versus suffering, and so yo we need to be on par with our former. So we uh, had suffering. Um, coming in a robe kind of stuff and um, we had the rocky music playing there we had you know pyrotechnics um, smart machines I mean, booked a lighting company to do our lighting 
and, and sent to our, you know, uh, our set, you know, this is what we're going to perform. So it, it was a big kind of thing, but I'm, and Sophie, uh, I sent to Sophie, going, yup, I bet you what I'm going to hear, you know, you know <laughs> I'm going, yeah, Sophie, but we got to do it, you know, because we can't just turn up there, you know, you know, just do our songs and go home. We have to make a mark because, you know, it's the way it's been promoted. We've got to do something different and something that people are going to remember. And vice versa, uh, Malkith would do the same, you know, gays band to, you know, come with ideas. Look, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? You know, we need to come on with. So he came with um, the flags of India, you know, like like the walk in these days, you know, when yeah. the boxers walk in. So yeah. he came with flags. And um, so as for me, it was healthy competition because, and the crowd would love it because, you know, they, they even they realized that, you know, these bands have made a fucking effort mm. of, you know, making this event into the way it's been hyped as and they've actually delivered as well because both acts to be honest with you we every act damages each other it was is with we've come on the crowd have gone crazy Malkit's come on the crowd have gone crazy again and everyone's walked out happy happy as Larry you know what I mean and uh, it was good though that vibe of uh, especially live music as well um and it, with the Suffrage Boys, it was with the Suffrage Boys. It was more of a family kind of thing. We used to spend obviously the weekends we used to spend together. As you know, all our weekends were doing weddings, and then Monday to Friday would be doing uni, uh, university gigs uh, up in another country. So we were like a close little unit, um, which I think at the time the other bands, not not a militia, they were quite jealous of that because you know. And they, and they you know what I mean? You know, because you know, they're always together. You know, they because in certain bands you do have certain groups of people. You know, they do their stuff. Certain members do their own stuff. But with the Suffrage Boys, we used to do everything together. Suffrage used to come in the van with us. We all used to unload the gear and everything. So it used to be proper teamwork, and we you know, we used to have a good laugh after the gig finished. We end up in a restaurant or something, and you know, just have a good laugh and you just talk about the day's performance and you know how many gigs we're coming up in the future what we're working on the next album. So it was, it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, which I think the in these kind of days, it's sort of, you miss that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And you could see that. I, I mean, your relationship with a lot of bands is like you're always kind of an integral part. And I think you've, you know, your philosophy and you can see when, I think when everyone talks about the Suffrage Boys, it's always a smile. It's a bit like, a bit like our Panasic either. You think it's always a smile. You know, yeah, the, yeah. Because the, the stuff, Suffering Boys is like the, the band of our age brand, and if you were gonna go into a band, that's the band to get into. <laughs> that's the one well, I mean, to get into. I I I remember we, we when we used to go to uh, a wedding and that stuff, and um let's go uh, we just tell you some people you yo, what what band is it? Oh it's the Suffering Boys. No way. Oh yeah. shit, man's gonna be shit hot today. I go, yeah. oh cheers, like, oh you guys are sick, man. You guys are sick. I mean and obviously, you know, the only way you get out of that is if you, if you can actually deliver the goods as well. And um, we used to put a lot of effort into obviously rehearsing and everything. And then obviously we end up going uh, uh, places abroad as well. One of our first major big tours was in Vancouver. And, um, you know, we've gone over there and we were like treated like a royalty, you know, five star hotels, you know, what, you know. Everything open everyone on best behavior, I believe. Yeah, no, yeah, of course. <laughs> standard. No, I mean, but but this was like, and you'll think about it, I was around about just coming up to eight, no, about 20 now when we first. So you on, couldn't on even our... legally drink there, could you? No, you couldn't. No, yes, true, you know. But I don't actually I'm I i do not drink so yeah, um, I don't, I'm just saying like... actually that's true, you know. Yeah, true, yeah. <laughs> oh shit. No, and that's me. So uh, at that age, so we've gone abroad now, and our first major tour is obviously um, Vancouver, and um, the promoters, uh, Music Waves, they've you know, we've gone there. They've treated us like proper royalty. We're like, yo, you know, normally you know, you know, and obviously we we haven't been on tour before, you know, so we don't know what you know what what the crack is, but you know, we were well, you know, whatever we want, you know, go mundo gija either. We're going, okay, can we have this? Oh, yeah, we'll get you that, we'll get you that. You know, take our shopping, show us around. I'm like, yo, this is fucking brilliant, man. This is the life. This yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yo, this is, this is fun, man. And so, and, but again, and so, and at the same time, we didn't really realize that how big we were in um, Canada. Because obviously, back in the early 90s, there wasn't no social media or anything like that. And sets would get filtered, you know, some cousin would come over to the UK, Copied. go to the shop copy it take it back to Canada and spread it between their friends and that's how 
they heard about the um, Sofri Boys in Kinda because people were taking um, sets over from the UK back to Kinda. Mm. And so we're quite big in Kinda, but we, but we haven't realized that because you know, there was no social media to you know, see how um, popular we're, we're getting around other places. We've gone to Kinda, the main show, complete sold out. Absolutely sold out. And we're going, yo, what the hell's happening here? And uh, so we've come down the escalators, but I go on stage and the crowd are grabbing us. Like these days, they grab the singer. Mm. Back in there, they're grabbing individual members of the band. Because back in those days, the, it, was, it wasn't just about the singer. It was about the band because mm. the albums were produced by the band. And so everyone sort of knew us and they're going, oh, yeah, you're that person, you're that person. And they were grabbing us and, yo, this is good, man. This is good. And oh, oh, as, as again, we um, delivered uh, what we came there to because I was quite adamant with the with the band. I got lads, we you know we need to. Our main focus is our performance. Mm. So you know, have a couple of drinks, but don't get too fucking tally. You know yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. And so you know, I, I, everyone was um, well behaved before the gig, after the gig, watch now. Um, <laughs> but. My emphasis was always um, make sure we do, we deliver the goods. We can't wait, you know, I don't want to walk off stage and go, yo, that was a shit performance. Uh, we can't do that again. But as I said, those days, we everyone was so eager to deliver what they can, you know what I mean? And, you know, it, everyone did put the work in. But were you that just... kind of, who, who was the one in the band then in terms of like, if you did have a poor performance to give the bollocking at? I was. It was just you. So you. Were... I was. I was. I was the most hated member in the band for the first two years because I wouldn't let no one drink. I got no. You know, no one's having a drink whatsoever, and so I wouldn't let no one drink in the band. Um, and I was probably the most hated member in the band. Um, but was, someone had to do it, and obviously, um, Sophia left me in charge. You go look. You sort out the band. You whatever you want to do with the band. And again, then the So you know, we used to come with. I, I would ask the band, I go, yeah, lads, we need to come with some more ideas for this, this, and this. You know, what I mean, so you know, put your heads together and, and let's try and come up with something. Um, so I was quite strict on um, rehearsals and um, performance, but after the gig, you know, relaxed. I go, you want to, you know, you can end up in A and you. I don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just as long as we deliver our, our performance, and after that, Joe Marji got But as I said, after two years, the band realized what I wanted from them, and so I go, "Let's okay, from, you know, from now on, you can have a drink, but I saw I'm not being ill." You know, yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't be ever in a situation where one of the members is too rat ass to perform. Yeah, and that that's not going to be acceptable. Yeah. I got that. I got that's definitely not, not going to be acceptable. Um, and at the same time, I think everyone, um, sort of no one was ever to that level that they couldn't perform. And yeah. so, you know, I, that, that was a blessing to the, fir- the first time. First time I played Dawn with Budget was at Victoria Palace, and it was I was on a trial, me and Jesh, and it's with Suffrey. So we like he was filled with do the DJ, and he goes, You just stand on the side and just, just tap along. So I always got a, a good, a strong. Reflect because there used to be the downstairs, and that yes. was the first time yes. where we are. Yeah, yeah, I went, I went down, down there, and I, you know, I won't ever say what I saw, but I thought, <laughs> okay, I'll go, okay, this is our band. You know I mean? <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. So, um, I mean, another fine mess was a- another album for me, which was, I think I bought that about three times because that is like for me, one of. I don't okay, I'm gonna say I think that album doesn't get enough respect. But nah, I mean that I the, love that album so much. I the bully is just unbelievable on that album. No, but the the only the only criticism I would say to another five mess, it was the complete same formula to Bomb the Dumbi. Mm. Uh, that's the only thing I would um say I wouldn't say that was negative. But that, that, that's the only thing I would personally uh, criticize. Was that because you were, like you said it earlier in the interview, where you were thinking about, oh, I've got to, we've got to try and beat the next one and just keep going up? Yeah, that no, way. but but at the same time, the way the Bomber Dumbi had, um, you know, done beyond our, our, our 
expectations. Yeah. Um, I use the same formula because it worked. Mm. Um, so th- that's the only criticism I will give to myself that um, I use the same, complete same formula for another 5MS. No, you're right. I mean, we, we enjoyed doing another 5MS as well. It was it was because we've done one album and we, we're basically doing another six songs in the same kind of format. Mm. And uh, so that was quite easy. And at the same time, um, now I've learned how to uh, program. Yeah. Um, on 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 the on, on the Atari, so I was doing a lot of the work at home myself, which obviously saves uh, time and money in the studio. Because if you got to do everything at the studio, it obviously takes more time. But if you go there pre prepared with your programming, everything done, you're har- you're halving the time because you've done the majority of the homework at home. Yeah, and so you're just getting in there, knocking vocal in, getting the musician in. Everything can be done in one day. Because as I said, normally uh, back back in the day, one day will be just laying the track down. But if you've got it pre-programmed, if you do your homework at home, yeah, then everything's already set, and you just need to bring in the musicians and you can get it done within two days. So, so at this point, are you, are you starting to work with other artists? And is Suffrey then starting to work with other producers at that time? Was that no? How, I mean, I mean, we were to be honest with you. Um, I did have quite a few other artists that wanted to, um, you know, asking for music. Um, but at the same time, we were just um, just too chocker with um, performances. And um, and then at the same time, you know, we were squeezing in, you know, like back in the day, it was proper work, work in, in the sense like we would work any time we had off, it was in the studio. Um, and so we hardly virtually had any time off. To we we I, I didn't have I didn't have any time up to work with any other artists at the time because we were absolutely inundated with booking with Suffrey Boys and then any time that we did have off, it was in the studio. Let's work mm. on some new tracks. Um, and for the for the I think from since 1990 to about 96, we were absolutely chocker with um, bookings and you know touring as well. Um, so. It it was it was a busy time for everyone. It was it was, it was very busy. I remember one week we ended up doing seven gigs, <laughs> lagatar. Uh, as I said, Monday Friday would be uh, university gigs, college college functions, that kind of stuff. And Saturday Friday nights to uh, Sunday was weddings and parties, and so we were just absolutely chocker. But you know it was a it was a good payday. But uh, um, yeah, I'm, I was gonna say I was like all of a sudden like. You know, you you obviously got people got full. That was the tradition at the time. People having full time jobs and and having doing gig work as well. But I'm sure at the some stage it comes into a bit where some artists or some people started thinking I could just do this full time. I mean, it's more of the case now. Like that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I was, coming through. I was um, at that time. I was I was doing it full time because uh, uh, to be honest, with you, I, we were quite chucker, as I said, with bookings and uh, any time we did have a, you know off, we would be me and Sophie would be in the studio. Uh, working on um, some next song or something else like that, and um, so we uh, so I didn't get Percy any hardly any time to work with any other artists. Um, we at the same time it was good as well because um, everything I was doing at the time was was working, and so I, w- I wasn't really complaining about it. Mm. Uh, and um, and I was I was having uh, working with someone like Suffrey anyway. It's it's it makes life easier to to work knowing that yo he I I can ask him anything to do and he'll deliver it. Um, yeah, so yeah, so I mean from ninety two to ninety four because we released uh, ninety four. I think we released another five mess. Is that right? Uh, look, man, uh, we, all I'm I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm getting lost in just your ages. Yes. Nineteen ninety <laughs> ninety was legends. Nineteen ninety two was Bombatumbi or ninety one. And ninety four was another one miss because I know because ninety five is pure magic, isn't it? Correct, correct. Yeah. And so that's when you start, you know, another classic album with Sadagio. Yeah, no, because okay, to, to be honest with you, um... were you making it at the same time? I'm guessing that you got to be because the timelines. Because did it wasn't one song that was proposed to. I, I, I'll give credit on uh, Satman's podcast, um, a fantastic podcast. I love him. 
And um, in that interview, saying that it was one of the songs, Gidevich was actually for Sofri, I believe. First. Yes. I said, no. Um, I wanted to do um, Gidevich and Anshala with um, Sofri. Um, so obviously, this is after now another five mess. And I did approach him and I said, Sofri, go on here. He goes, get here. I go, one was the other, Shalak, the Gidevich, not good here. And um, the other one, Shalak. He goes, nah, yar. Exactly. He's got nah, yar. You know, I don't, I don't want to do any more cover versions. I want to do my own songs. I go, okay, I, I can understand that, but I got it. You know what I mean? I, I go, yeah, you trust me. Come on. Yeah, I go, got <laughs> you know, Trust me, the, 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 you know, these are good songs. He goes, nah, I, I, I'm not feeling him. I go, Chalpe, I'm, I, I can't force you to do it, but I go, because. As a singer, I, I I can see his point of view that yeah. he doesn't want to be known for just singing co-versions. Yeah. Of obviously of other but that's people's what it, just digress slightly. That's one of your things though, as well. You you've always done quite a lot of covers over your career. Yes. Is, is that a conscious decision that you've done, or is it just no, it, it's it's not it's um it's something that I know can work. I, I know I don't know, you know, it probably sounds silly, but it's like Something when I hear something, I go, "Yo, I, I can work with that. I can work with that." And yeah. it, I, I know, yo, it's 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 easy cop out of saying, "Oh, it's it's a cover version." But some of the cover versions that we've done from back in the day, even with V Twenty One, which we'll we'll discuss further. I can't wait. Um, it's like we, we tend to pick song, pick songs that you know are not really heard um, by the general public. Uh, in the masses, like especially like with B Twenty One songs, and that's why I wanted to drop uh, Dilshad Doctor because that hadn't been heard um, by the masses, um, and I thought it was a banging track because I heard it back in or one of the DJs played it from some wedding, and I thought yeah that's a banging track, but it could it could be done good in a with a bit of a modern touch, and uh, I was I was a bit gutted that. Um, so free didn't want to do it. Mm. Um, but then for, for some odd reasons, that was uh, called up and said, listen, I want to do an album. I go, okay. And I, I couldn't believe that he mentioned Giddevich and Challa. I'm going, you want to do those? He goes, yeah. I go, oh, I'll go, okay, brilliant. That's that's perfect. I go, I, I was thinking to do that anyway. Mm. Um, so that's how I ended up doing it with um, Sadara. I was, I was more than happy. Now, Pure Magic, that was one album that was underrated. If if you're Midlands, it's it, I think it's regional because I, I think oh, I I love that album. The, it was like the Babyface Assassin cover, you, just, <laughs> yeah. you know, just the way you know the way. It is. No, I, 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 why why do you think it's underrated? Why do you think it's underrated? No, I think it's um it, it was it was a banging album to be honest with you, um, um but it didn't get the advertisement that he's supposed to okay. get okay from uh, from a marketing point of view that yeah, was, yeah yeah sorry marketing was was lack on it but people that heard it they were coming and go yo giza that album is sick uh but the uh marketing was done done right on that it was just um uh, just release it that's it um and at the same time I think that those that was a time where artists started doing solo stuff as well mm. Obviously, Sadara was uh, renowned for just work with Aplas Geet. But now, you know, artists are doing their, 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 own, their own stuff with um, different producers. Uh, but at the same time, I would just, you know, now just imagine if someone like Sufri had sang it. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, you know, I'm, not, I'm not taking anything else. Sadara delivered it uh, bangingly because, um, because actually Sufri did play a part in the album. He I, know, I, played... I know the answer to this because obviously I listened to that podcast, but it's the it's the thumbi in it, right? Sofri actually played the thumbi on Gidevich. Um because I had booked um Devraj to actually play the thumbi. And Devraj couldn't play it the way I wanted it to be played. And so and that's when Sofri grabbed the thumbi and goes, Listen, Minupata, I know what you want. Yeah, yeah, I'll play it. And he dropped it. He dropped it. And I got Padu. Because even if you hear that, if you hear that piece, everyone knows what song it is. No, because uh, the tumbi, you know, tang, 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 that first couple of notes, they had to be perfect. And the way Deiraj is playing, 
you know, God bless his soul. I mean, he would he would, he, he would just not get it right for the way I wanted it. And Suffrey obviously obviously I worked with him, you know, all that and he knew exactly what was what I wanted. And luckily he could play Dumbi as well. And so he went in, dropped it straight away. He goes, I know exactly what he went. Dang, 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 dang. I went, perfect Suffrey, Badu. That is so what... so Suffrey did play a part of it. That is that and then I'm gonna open the, I'm gonna open the door to slightly to B21 because it, obviously with Bali and this starts coming into it now. The, yeah, no, uh, that was actually uh, pure magic was the first time I ever took Bali to the studio. Um, he was young anyway, and uh, so did he behave? Uh, yeah, no, he he was he was um, he was enjoying it because he did the backy vocals on um, Giddevich and Chella, so he got first time to be in the studio. Ah, uh, to... That's another bit of gold. I didn't know that. Oh, you know, yeah. If you actually read the inlay, I've lost my cassette. That's it. I can't, I've, I've got them. I've got them. Yeah, read the inlays. It says back in vocals. Again. Back in vocals by um, Sofri, Ajinder Kang, uh, Kalsi, Bali Jagpal, and Buddha Jagpal um, for the for the backing vocals. Yeah, so that was his first ever experience in a studio, and so he enjoyed it though. He enjoyed it. Obviously, you see me work. How I was doing it, and uh, especially the way I laid down the track. Um, Did you start was, having a collection of your like? I, I know, I know. It's the one thing that's always, always kind of everyone always asks about you. Yeah, where's your own solo project? Like we wanted you to do a boot a jag part album, and you we've been promised to it, and you've lied to us. Yeah, on, no, 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 yeah, I, I know that. But the, <laughs> listen, listen. The point, the, the point is, yeah, it's like I'm giving you. All these tracks and the way I where I see it, they're all my solo projects. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <thank you. laughs> they're all my solo projects. No, but I'm sure, like, and I, and I, I've done this when I've interviewed a few of us. Like, they've always got so many unreleased tracks there, and it's yes. all been done. And yeah, is there a time where you say, "Look, whatever, it, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna release these as a vault. i do not care about what the reaction is of it. If these are in there, uh, no, I, I, I'll be honest with you. It's like, um. Back in those days, we, we we didn't have the luxury of time. Yeah. Um. We had to get, you know, the more time you spent in the studio, the more expensive the album was going to cost uh, to the record label. Um, now, these days, it's more everything's done on computers in mm. at, at home. And so you get more judgmental about your own work. Um, and so that's why that's one of my pet hates is that I do stuff. My kids hear it, they go, yo, it sounds good. I'll change it. And so, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get down and go, yo, that sounded fine. But I'll change it. This sounds okay as well now. So, you know, you, you get a bit of a, you know, it's one of these kind of things where you, you're always too contradictive of your own. Um, your work. Your work. And uh, so, so that sometimes holds it back from getting released. But when people hear it, they go, yeah, that sounds, that sounds fine. Sounds good. I'm going, Really? Uh, okay, if you say, but so. why, why, like, you, you, where, where are you? Oh, here's the question. Then, do you think that the the eighteen, I know, the seventeen, eighteen year old would listen to what you'd be doing now? They would have that much confidence in their work that to release it anyway. If you know you've done a good job, because you, I'm guessing you wouldn't have heard, you wouldn't let anybody else's opinion from there. You wouldn't listen to my opinion and say oh, I'm going to change it because like, I know fuck all. But you'd be. Like you've got the reputation and the bravery to do that. I mean, I mean, I'm, I remember True School asked me this. He goes, "So, how did you feel when you, you know, at that age, you did Legends, Bomber Dumbi, and the Mess? How did you feel?" And I'm going to be honest with you. At that age, I didn't give a shit. I'm going. I was fearless. I'm going. I don't give a damn. I'll drop anything. It's, it's going to be fun, but obviously you, the older you get, you are supposed to get a bit more wisdom. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm I'm very judgmental of, of myself, which is one of my um, bad things about me. Is like I, I get too judgmental about my own work. Um, where back in the day, I'm going, I would hear it, I go, that's done, release it, release it. Now I think, no, nah, I don't release it. It's, not, it's 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 good, but it's not the way I think. But as I said, we, we when Trusco asked me, because he, he was a diehard fan of uh, Bomber Dumbi, and um, I go, and he's you know gone through that album inch by inch, and I go, I go, suck, I go. If you actually listen to the album, it's very simple. 
it's nothing complicated. It's, it's no, you know, heavy budget pieces or something or heavy, you know, shit ass drug or something. I go, it's very simple. If you listen to it carefully, very simple. I go, that's always been my uh, my kind of thing is trying to keep it as simple as possible, but at the same time trying to make it exciting. Because and I that's think, always, I think that's, always, that's, always, that, that's that's personally myself. That's always worked for me. But I, I think it was at that time, like, Bomb the Dumby was so fresh in its sound the way that it was. I think it was just going to stick out. And, and that's what, like, it, it was a perfect storm for success. The, 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 the one thing that always makes me laugh about Bomb the is that it's called Bomb the but we never actually played a live Tumbi in it. That's, <laughs> that, that's the most disturbing thing about it. I'm going, actually, and because I didn't realize that Sofri could play Tumbi that well. It's only when we, I think we did a. Um, um, pure magic. I realized, yo, he's a bad, he's a badass Tumbi player. Oh, he, because... never, he never told you before. Then. Oh no, he didn't. <laughs> no, because um, he played um, Tumbi on Panagade, but he lost the core. He part of the Tumbi, mm. and so he used um, the um, big pen, the, the 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 head of it. Yeah. He used that, and, but it didn't sound too tough. The Tumbi on that one, so I thought, yo, he he ain't all that. But when he dropped fucking on pure magic, he played the Tumbi. I go, yo, you're a badass player. I didn't realize he was such a such a badass Tumbi player as well. Um, so uh, that's what I always love for Bomber Tumbi. It was always a sample Tumbi that I used on it. It wasn't actually a live Tumbi, which oh. would be would be something something different. Okay, so B twenty one and. The, the 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 origin story of it. So how did that come about from it? So you we've already got the the bit where Bali's starting to enter into the into the studio. He's a he's featured on backing vocals and stuff. So how were you? Uh, how did how did it start? Um, well, I, he was he just. It's hard to explain how he started. He was like he just was eager to get to do something. Um. He ended up actually his f- first ever performance was at the dome. I'm going, uh, how the how the fuck did that happen? He's ended up at the dome. Um uh, because obviously he knew I'm just Sidhu. And he goes, uh, I want to do a track, just one track. And it's a coverage of, of Sadhu Sakanda with Sadhu Sakanda's vocals. So he just mimed over that track at the dome back in 94, 5 ish. And I uh I'll, I'll give him that. He's got balls for doing that, because I've seen other artists where they get booed off for doing a doing a PA, and but for some odd reason he, he went down okay, because um, because I, I was there anyway with Suffering because we were performing there, and also then I and now live on stage, it actually wasn't by Jack, but it was B twenty one, so he went on stage as B twenty one, and that was his first ever performance at the Dome. He sang, as I said, this this dual song, and he had two Kaliya with him as dancers, and he just mimed the whole track, and that was it. He was over the moon. He was happy with it. Went, Gij You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So that that was that was Bally's first um, introduction, and you know, think about it. His first ever performance at the Dome. Lucky fucking get he, he, he doesn't do anything. You know, you look back back on it. He is like the Lucky trajectory get, is ridiculous. Yeah, entry. Isn't it? In, at the dome. Oh gosh, first event. Oh, look, you get you know what I mean. There you go. And then, um, so from 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 then, like, um, just see, Sidhu was uh, good friends with him, I believe, it, and uh, they kind of paired up. Or no, how okay. did he get into the scene? Okay, it was like, um, we knew Jesse from back in the day. They used to live um, next door, um, from uh, Boa's house. Um, in Hansworth um, on Sycamore Road. Um, and I do remember Jesse um, back in the day, but I didn't realize, I didn't realize who he was from, from back in the day. I only when a couple of years further down where I went to his house, I saw a picture of him. I thought, oh, okay, I remember you now. And so, yeah, but so Bali was hooked up with Jesse and them two started a album together. I had nothing to do with it. So they've gone to a studio, one of them, one of, them, uh, one of our mates sat, gone to his studio and they've recorded one of the first tracks. It was fucking terrible. And um, he's played it to me, like, what do you think, what do you think? So Bally's played it to me, like, what do you think? I go, Giza, you can't release that. Maybe you know what I mean? You know, you can't do that, man. 
He goes, nah, it sounds all right. I go, nah, it sounds terrible. I go, everything's all over the place. He goes, well, help us out then. Help us out, you know. Do something for us. I go, okay, I'll I'll produce it for you for you guys. So I was just brought in just to produce it, to be honest with you. Uh, because what what them what them two had done originally was um just you know the typical you know go in the studio just do something you know it, it sounds fine it, but it wasn't it was it was terrible it was it was embarrassing um and so that's where uh, that was the only reason I got involved just obviously because he's my brother and um so I took off um took control of the whole music aspect and then uh, book in the studio, getting the um, um, product finished, and we ended up um, producing that at uh, Planet Studios in um, Coventry. Um, that was done quite quickly, to be honest with you. Um, and I wasn't expecting anything out of it, uh, but I did put uh, some time into it. Um, we released the first album that we do was Public Demand, but it didn't really. It was just a average run-of-the-mill album to a, um, that was released and at the same time that was the first time that we we released because at that time the biggest uh, record label in the UK was Roma Music Bank mm. and um, I did actually go to Pripal when we started Public Demand I mean not sorry not Public Demand um, uh, Sounds of B21 and I, I just didn't get the right vibe from uh, Prepar at the time when I asked him, well, if I'm doing an album with my brother, um, what are you saying? Um, and it, it was like, you know, okay, just do the album. Uh, if it's good, we'll take it off you. If it's not, then I, which I wasn't expecting that from um, Prepar because I, you know, I'd have given him um, Bomba Thumbi, Another Fire Mess, Legends, Pure Magic. Um, I was expecting more to say, okay, let's sit down, let's discuss um, how much you want for it, what's the budget for, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But So that didn't happen. And so I went back to Bali. I go, listen, um, um, I'm not really happy with uh, Roma. He goes, okay, I'll I'll try and try and find someone else. I'll go, well, I'll carry on. And so he actually found Movie Box. Uh, God knows how he found them. And he's come back. He goes, listen, I've, I've done a deal with this record label move I've never heard of them and he goes yeah but they've agreed to my terms of how much it, we want for the album and everything like, okay listen if they've agreed to that that's brilliant uh, which was at that time it was it was good because this was a, a new record label and they've oh. taken a chance on us um, and they've agreed to all our terms and conditions and and at that time it was quite hard because at that time, the main, the, the big artists were in demand. You know, you had, you had your Aplas Geet, as you know, DCS and that kind of stuff, Milk Geet, everything, and even like Suffrey. And, the, and those were the, the big boys of the industry. And for a new act to get that kind of deal, it was, it was good for, it was, it was, it was very good for us guys. And we were happy with it. Um, but, but the album was okay. It wasn't like, oh, wow, you know, it's a game change or anything. Um, it was just an average album. Person. I remember I remember when it was released. Um, I think you guys must have done like a press day at Radio XL or on Cash and Polly show then. Probably, no, I, I mean, our, our main track on there was Kike Kene Kike Kene puts that on there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, uh, the only contra- controversial thing about that song was, is the, that song was uh, a bit of a piss take of the puts the on there and but the younger generation didn't really understand the lyrics of that oh, song yeah uh but they just like the hook line uh and uh so they didn't really get the gist of the song but we knew exactly what the song meant and and it was a it was a lot of piss take out of the song of the puts the on there but uh for us guys it just worked and uh, it's a bit, it's a bit cheeky. I was doing that song in the first place, but it, it, it did work for us guys a little mm. bit. And so we've done that album, and um, obviously, so I got to know Jussie from from there, and it was at actually my wedding where Bally's turned around. He goes, "Listen, me and my mate want to do a, a couple of songs." I, I turned around, and go, "Who?" 
He goes, him, I go, fuck that. I go, you ain't going to sing them already. He goes, nah, nah, go on, man, go on. Let me, let me. I go, well, go on then. Because uh, we are at um, DCS. Yeah. Uh, at my wedding. So, awesome. This did, you turn, did you turn away when, it, when, they, when they went on stage? No, I mean, no, I mean, it was, it was a good, uh, it was a good vibe that day anyway, you know, DCS killed it anyway. Mm. Um, and then, so this guy that I ain't got a clue who he is, he's gone on stage and he sang um, a Janus Hare Ganga, which I mean, it was, <laughs> all right, no, no, not, not the best, best of songs to pick. And so he sang that song and Bally's gone on with him, just, you know, just with the mic and, you know, just saying whatever he wants to. It's fine. That was it. And so, that's how I got really introduced into uh, Jesse was at my wedding, really to say that this is the guy that I'm working with. Bali was telling me that he's working with a guy uh, on the project. And that's, that's when I realized he's working with this guy. Uh, and that was the only reason I got involved. Um, so, yeah, we've released Sounds of V21. It's done okay. Nothing to brag about. Um, so then we've started working on... Um, um public demand but at the same time i remember uh Pripa rang me when we released um sounds of b21 and he asked me Listen, have you signed up with anyone i go yeah he goes you you should have come to me i go but i did come to you but you know the, the way you not a bad way i go the way you sort of approached it wasn't the way i wanted um you to handle it but uh obviously we've we signed up with a record label uh movie box um, so they sort of lost out on that, um, on that, which was unfortunate for them, but it was good for Movebox as well. And so obviously now we've started working on um, public demand. And so public demand was a completely different kind of venture where now, because sounds B21, I did all the production. Mm. Um, but now we're doing public demand. Obviously Bally's been with me uh, within the studio so he started um getting a, a like for work you know going into studios and you know trying out new kind of stuff and so he's got into studio and he's started working on some regime money tracks um and then he's dropped live and direct which ah gosh it was a it, it sort of blew up and then obviously he had um, he became a megastar after that yeah no I mean he, he's dropped that obviously he's dropped a uh, and Sony theme here and um, he's um, used Sofri to sing that but at the same time I was a bit gutted we're going Sofri I don't do, don't do any more cover versions <laughs> and, you, and you're dry, and you're dropping Nakarabini Sony theme you know what I mean and so um, but but Bali kind of, Bali wooed him yeah yeah, no, I mean, I mean, cause th- that was the era where um, artists started working with other artists, yeah. um, with uh, other DJs or other producers, and that was the in thing at that time as well. Now, you know, working with different um, different producers and that kind of stuff. And so, Bally just booked himself into uh, Planet Studios and started working on the album. And like the engineer of that place, Tom, yeah, you know, obviously he helped him a lot um, to produce the album. Obviously, Bally had bare absolute bare ideas in his in his head like yeah. this is a, i'm gonna want to use this sample i want to use that sample um and he had bare you know he was thinking out of the box kind of thing uh for that age as well and then he would go to the studio then come back have a big dirty smile on his face and play me the track you this is what i've done to the studio what you think what you think and obviously when he did um not gonna be his only thing he had it he had it on actually two tempos he had it slow and then fast, slow, fast, slow, fast. And Sophie's rang me up. He goes, listen, oh, no, sorry, I got it, got it. Tell me to keep it at one tempo. <laughs> I go, yeah, I go, I go. You're going to turn around and say, I'm not getting involved. You should have come no, to No, no, I mean, no, no, no. Because after and Bally's played me, and I'm going, yeah, sounds good. But I go, and Sophie was right. He goes, you need to keep it at one tempo. I go, yo, you need to keep it at one tempo because it's it's not it's not making any sense. Um, so uh, luckily he did take... Uh, my advice on that, like, okay, let's have a one tempo. And Sophie was happy with it. He was happy with it. I heard it. I got, yeah, sound, sounds banging. And then again, he dropped, uh, not Sophie, Geekene, Geekene, Posadar, and the original from Ranjit Money. And um, yeah, as you said, he was a 
instant success uh, overnight. And um, yeah, it was it was a good time for him. It was a very good time for him. For those, the dance moves were premiered. They weren't there because everyone had all those. <laughs> Although, uh, you know, I'll put my hand away to copy your dance moves, man. So. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, cho- you know, all the choreography it was, uh, that was all Bali. It was, it was I, I had no part in that whatsoever. Just see, not, not a chance. Um, Bali was the, the showman. He was always had the, he used to organize the, the, the little rehearsal for the dance moves. And with those dance moves were done in my garage in Hansworth. Um, just you know, okay. This is the dance move. This that or this or that or whatever. And yeah, but did you did you feel like I'm just saying it? Yeah, because obviously you're the old you're older. Adam. You've been you're in these bands. You've been doing all this for like that. Did did you feel any cringiness where you've been asked to do dance moves? Um, y- yes and no. Yes and no. Um, they were like they were like dance dance moves like proper proper choreography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, was yeah. just basic. And it, it it was it was very basic but effective. That's mm. what amazed me. I'm going, okay, we're doing dance moves, but we're not like technical about this. We're keeping it simple because obviously, um, I'm not trying to take the piss away. Jesse wasn't like the, the best of dancers, so we just keep it very very basic. But it would look good when um, the three of us would actually do them together. Uh, it would just look good. Uh, I it, that did. Kind of work in our favor, to be honest with you, um, because when we when we started um, started doing gigs like that, people were always cop- copy our moves. Yeah, and, you know, at the front, you know, start doing, you know, yeah, which was which was good. We're going, okay, it's working. We ain't got a problem with it. But that was all Bali. That was all Bali. So how how were you balancing your time then as you're working on public demand with like the suffrage and the and your own your own band stuff? Was that you 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 just said you married as well? So like you know, I mean, life balance and all these spinning all these plates. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm always happy if I'm if I'm working. Uh, you know, I hate to be not doing nothing. So I was busy on you know I was busy with Suffrage Boys, uh, B21. Now we you know we started working on obviously um, public demand. Um, there was but some time between that, weren't there? There was some time between Sansa B21 and Yeah, B uh Sansa B21 were released was released in 96. Yeah. And then Bali released uh 97, 97 and then we re-released public demand in 98. Yeah. Um but I would probably say public demand was more of a Bali uh project. He actually started that with um Jandigar the first track and so that was all Bali. Um I came back from a gig uh with Suffrey and then Bally's rang me up go listen we're uh at so and so place pop down you know we'll 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 have a little um sit down and have, have, have um have a listen to the track. Um so I've gone down to meet him up there and he's played me the track and I've gone okay yo this sounds this sounds fucking good man mm-hmm. you go nah and so but Bally and just see both there I go Yo, trust me, this is a banging track you, you know you you've done here. You sounded absolutely fine, and um, they 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 wouldn't believe me. They go, you're you're just taking the piss. I go, listen, I don't normally take the piss. I go, but that's a banging track. Once it's finished, I go, it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a you know a banger to be honest with you. Um, so John Deagle was the first track that we actually worked on, and then I decided to um, start with. Dior uh, Davia and Portete. Uh, and at that, at, to be honest with you, at the same time, um, I was I started working on um, Suffrage 24 7. So I had just finished working on 24 7, and we used a different studio altogether. Uh, there's another studio in Coventry, Cabin Studios. Um, and so I'd worked on the full 24-7 album with Suffrey uh, in that studio. And then I thought, well, if I'm in the studio, I might well end up doing the, um, some of the B21 B, B, uh, tracks here as well. So we ended up doing um, Cortete and um, Dior Davia at um, Cabin Studios. And Bali was working at um, Planet with um, with um, Tom. So he did Jandigar, Chittiyan Kapadiya, Din Raat, and I did Kotete, Dior Davia, and together we did Potsuzarande, uh, which was the last um, 
track. And, and you and, and you just you just obviously just glanced over it, and I, we you you did like Paul Pongre at that at that. At that yes, time. yes, oh, shit, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like, no, I mean, so, <laughs> yeah, no, okay, I, I'll tell you, a ninety. I remember ninety eight. Is yeah, this was nineteen ninety eight. I had gone to India in January, and we still had one track, no, two tracks to finish. Uh, I've gone to India. Same time in India, I discovered Darshan um, while I was in India. So obviously, I brought that back as well. Um, I've come, I've come back from India, and Bally's picked me up from the airport, and he goes, "Listen, I've done the uh, fifth track, which was Dinrat, mm. and he's on a garage ship." I wasn't, I wasn't into English music, and so he's picked me from Heathrow. He's played this, and uh, he, he goes, "What do you think?" I'm going. Yes, okay, but where's where's the music pieces? There was no music pieces, just you know mm. samples. I go, where's the music? He goes, there is nothing. He goes, that's where I've done it. Mm. I'm like, okay. I go, he goes, it'll work, it'll work. I go, okay, if you say so, not a problem. That track worked not in the Midlands, but in London, they were bloody fucking crazy for that track. Mm. It's on a gar- proper garage uh, and garage tip, and um, they went absolutely ballistic in London area for Dinrath. Um, and so the last track was uh, Darande, where Bally's actually started it, and then I've come in with the um, the chord, the all the chord work, and then got the uh, door players in, which were um, Dips, Palm, and some neck chord, which I can't remember. It's on the inlay. Um, so we did that that one we did together, um, myself and Bally, and so we knocked that out. It was quite quick to be honest with you. Uh, I think three to four months tops from start to finish. Yeah, we knocked out public demand because it was good because um, Bally would have his own ideas, and then I would have my own own ideas. But Bally was into his hip hop and that kind of um, vibe. I was into my straightforward desi music, and so when we mix it together, it was it was a nice formula, and mm. like even Bally, Bally, and myself chose. All the songs, and so Jussie Job was quite uh, easy to 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 an extent where he didn't actually have to go out to find you know songs. They were sort of handpicked from obviously obviously cover versions. John D. Girl was a cover version. And the funny thing about it is that like, people actually don't know that. They probably know now through social media, but John D. Girl was an old track uh, cover version. Never did uh, anything for the artist from back in the day. The old they are. Another cover version. So uh, how did you? Sorry, I, I don't want to get you into trouble on this. Actually, I so, uh, just in case. But like in terms of copyright, how does that play now? Does it copyright like... wasn't wasn't an issue back in those days because yeah. Asian music wasn't at the frontier. Was, obviously, English music was yeah the 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 main source of UK music. So, and obviously, social media wasn't around then. Um, the late nineties, ninety. So this is ninety eight. So tracks wouldn't get you know around the world the way they get around the world these days and so it will filter through slowly so copyright i know you know it, it's a bit naughty taking mm-hmm. tracks from other uh, uh, other people but we sort of re- rejuvenated the old tracks you know if you do hear generally got the old version it's you can't really dance to it uh but lyrically it's it's it, it, it's it's banging and so the only thing we did was change the music around and make it the UK vibe, which was happening at that yeah. time, um, and just and, these vocals are so distinct to that as well. Like that's why no, it it's because at say at that time the the heavyweights were Sufri and Malkith in in the UK, and then for all of a sudden for someone like Jussie to be on that same kind of not 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 stage, but the same not not, not even level, um, that same kind of pull that we had from the crowd. Like, yo, these guys have come up with something different. Um, and we were we were sort of catering for our generation because these are, these are tracks that uh, we've grown up with. Um, but I said, we, we, you know, all these old tracks, we got these tracks from when we used to go visit India. We used to, you know, go to our mom's house and go, yo, and so we bought these tracks back from India from back in the day. And so we had these tracks, but we just revamped them. And even today, people still think like tracks like Chandigarh, Dior Davia, Dinrat are B21 tracks. 
but obviously Chandigarh was a uh, Hardeep Gill. Dior Davia was the next artist, and Din Rath was a um, female singer. Can't remember, can't, can't remember the name. <laughs> now. And and the only original track on that was uh, uh, not uh, Oscarina de Lutia, uh, which was written by uh, Dear Rajasal. And that was probably the only original track on the whole album, <laughs> and all all the rest were covers. But they were they were properly revamped. They were like just you know let's let's just do it. Yeah. Like even at that time, um, another band, uh, Intermix, had released um, Jandigar. Um, and it was even done at the same studio at Planet Studios. Um, and even the same engineer engineered it for them. Oh my god! <laughs> which was which was funny, but it's ours. I'm gonna say we, yeah, ours was better, but because we spent a lot of time doing it and we had the vision that we wanted to you know the way we wanted to do it it was perfect for us and we as again i always just tell Bally, keep it simple don't get too into let's keep it simple simple always works and it did work so you know when um you said that the first album did okay and stuff but you called it back by public demand mm. the second album was was that like from what the the label was telling you? What? Well, how did you come up with the name with that? Bally, Bally. That's that's that's. I I, I can bullshit say oh, I I come with the name now. Bally came with the name. That was B twenty was more of a Bally uh, Bally kind of um project. Mm. It was it wasn't really much. So I I just got involved just to help out, but that was more of a Bally project where he named the first album Sounds of B twenty one. Second album was obviously um. Public demand, uh, that was all all Bally's ideas. So that was m- more or less Bally's. But I was there just for guidance. To be honest with you, um, and if something sounding sounded wrong, I would go. Oh, that sounds wrong. That's that's not right. You, that we, we, you know, we, we need to change it. Obviously, because I had um, more experience, uh, obviously, than Bally um, in studios and the right keys of the songs and everything like that. So obviously, and I appreciate him listening to me on uh, certain things like yeah. that's wrong. Yeah. Take that out, take that out. But at the same time, he had, he was young and he had a lot of fresh, fresh ideas, which obviously was shown through public demand. And his own uh, work as well. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's what I mean. He, 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 even sometimes he would, he would amaze me. Um, I'm like, you did that. He goes, yeah, he goes, uh, we use this sample from here. I go, but yeah, fair enough. You use sample, but it's worked. Like, like example, like say, like Punjabi MC when he used um, Buster Rhyme sample. Yeah, what about going? You know, it worked. Um, if, you know, fitting like a glove. Um, and funny enough, it's like Darshan was sort of based around Mudita Bachkari. Keep it simple. Don't be at all. Yeah. Uh, Darshan was if you if you sort of do look at it. It's the same kind of formula. Do all and tumbi, but keep it simple. Uh, simple always works. Always remember that. Simple yeah, I am. Works. I'm gonna write that. Yeah, actually. Keep it simple, yeah. <laughs> simple always works. Keep, they also um, say kisses it. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no. That's what we. I, I, that's, that's always been my motto. Is yo simple. Let's try and keep it simple. Even when we um, do live performances uh, with bands and everything like that, lads. Let's keep it nice and tight and simple. Let's, uh-huh. not, let's, let's, get, let's not let let's not get too technical about it. Let's just keep it nice and simple. I'm gonna I'm gonna say something really controversial now. Yeah. Um, so it's like you know the height of B21. I think people under Esther have forgotten how big you guys were, like massive. Like it was huge. It, yeah, it was. It and was. so like how, what in, in your when you look back on that. Was there one time that you could think like, oh shit, this is huge. Like what are we doing? It's mad. No, I, to, to be honest with you, I mean, uh, myself, I always, always keep, a, um, I'm very level-headed like that. I mean, fame can get to, can get to people. It was, uh, I knew that B21 uh, were getting bigger and bigger than, but at the same time, we were, we were dropping the right kind of tracks that people mm. wanted. Um like everything that we released, it was just working in in our favor, and we having you know, I mean, just working the the three of us, it would it would be a lot of fun as well. Now going to studio, trying out new ideas, 
um, having arguments saying, you know, like, that sounds shit, and I'll fucking change that. Now that, you know, you ain't got a clue to do, you know, go out, have us, you know, do something, and, you know, don't come back and see you a couple of days. Nearly. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, and, uh, yeah, nearly. And um, it's, it's, it, 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 it was a lot of fun, um, but we always try to keep a, um, level-headed about it. Um, I remember when we, like, when, when Bali did um, Giovanni, it was, um, when I first heard it, I was like, I was blown back from it. I'm like, yo, what the fuck have you done here? That sounds, to me, that sounds sick. Um, and the alternative was just you turning goes, no, nah, I don't like it. I don't, I don't, I don't like the song. I'm looking. I'm going, are you, are you fucking stupid? I go, I can't believe he's done that. You know, you know he's done, and I thought he was original. But I didn't realize he was, he was taking a sample from um, everything but the girl. Oh yeah. Um, I'm going, yo, it sounds fucking sick. Because <laughs> uh, obviously, Bally had that kind of different outtakes the way I was because he was more into using samples where I was trying to uh, recreate more of a desi kind of vibe but, but when you when we both clash like that it was wicked because then we get, we get the best out of his kind of view and then the best kind of uh, my view on it um, and then obviously when we released uh, Darshan that sort of blew up as well for us um, and that opened a lot of doors for us as well because it was it was it was a cover version, but no one actually knew it was a cover version. Um, but the way we delivered it, um, again, it was that track was done three days. It was three one day to just to go go in the studio, put a guide vocal down. Second day, put put the percussion down, and the third day, mix it. But you know, That's like how, you, you just said about the three characters of you there it was so strong individuals in itself. Mm -hmm. Was just that the way that how you communicated with each other? Just like oh, this is just like really direct and no i mean obviously um like um obviously bally being my brother you know we we could talk about anything like that um just he was equal as well we could have a proper laugh and e e even get serious about stuff but it was it was it was just fun it wasn't like you know a, a intention whatsoever it was just a lot of fun because uh, i could see both of them bally and jesse they were right like eager to do this kind of stuff and um, jesse was young at the time and so um um didn't have much knowledge in the, in the sense of how to pick songs or how to approach the writers or what kind of song would suit his kind of voice or you know what kind of theme to have the thong, um thong, song on um so he was um quite the, so that's where myself and bali were more from people because we were actually choosing the songs and then working on those songs all together um yeah, it was like um, the Ranja song. Uh, Bali first wanted to give that to Jussie, um, but Jussie um, didn't wasn't feeling it to a certain degree. So, and even I, even even I turned around and said, uh, "Nah, I'm not feeling it." Um, and so Bali went ahead and, and did it himself. Um, and when he played it back to me, I was I was taken back. I'm going again. I'm going, and this time he's actually singing on it. You know, thank thank God for auto tune, uh, but he was, he was actually singing on it. And I'm going, okay, you're not technically a singer, but you've done a fucking good job on it. You know, you and if you were shit, I, I'm I'm quite direct like that. Like, Yo, it's shit. Don't do that again. Mm. But it sounded fucking it sounded fresh. And he went and, and he went again. No, I saw, I saw me. And it just sounded fresh. I'm going. I'm going. How's he? How's he keep? How's he keeping? You know, doing these kind of tracks. Because um, he just one after the other, one after the other. Even when he started on um, uh, Arja Soria, he played it to me. And I, what you think? What you think? I go, yeah, it's okay. That, that was my reaction. It's okay. I didn't say, yo, it's it's a banging track. And obviously, he, he proved me wrong on that aspect. Like, it that went crazy for him as well. Uh, Arja Soria was, and that was his first video he's ever done as well. Um, and the record label, they were very um, supportive of him because he hadn't failed them in any way. Um, yeah. He just kept on giving them hit after hit. And so they were happy with it. And so when he um, wanted a video to go with I Just Want It, which same time videos were like a luxury back in those days uh, to get a video out there. And like even those days, most people would go to India to get the videos done. 
but he wanted to do in the UK so he can get a bit more control over it. Um, so he got, I think, surrender from the frantic camp to do the video. And it was a good, uh, when I saw the video, I was quite impressed. I'm going, okay, that's, you know, it's a good track now for himself. And the way the track took off for him, again, um, different level altogether. And so, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give credit where he's due. And Barry did actually, um, uh, He's not actually a producer, but he, he has the he has the, the ability of the vision, the vision of how this track could go. Like Aja Sonia was um, released uh, about two years before Bally remixed it, and the track had done absolutely nothing. It was like track four of uh, an eight track album, and it was more like a tape filler. But so when Bally heard it. Um, and the actual record label had the rights for that track, so um, Bally Asper goes, "I need that. I need that song. If you could send me the actual stems uh, of that song." Um, and obviously, the record label had them anyway, so they sent him everything over, and then he he just remixed it, and the game a worldwide hit. From and uh, the same song was released two years ago and did absolutely nothing. Mm. So just by adding a certain thing and just modernizing it. He made it into a hit, and again he he did it very basically but effectively. So I'm going to come to a little bit of the difficult, the difficult part now because whatever sometimes whatever goes up must come down, yes, and exactly. um, and um, you know, I from a personal point of view, it was the first time that you've seen the, a massive successful kind of boy band image that's going mm-hmm. on. It had all the demographics the lads used to love, love especially the ones from Handsworth. We were like. Yeah. You know, you are um, our ambassadors and stuff. And because you used to still drive around in that area, we used to see you and I was playing dollars off budget and then obviously family and seeing each other from that way. I was like, oh, there's this weird personal connection that I thought, okay, yeah. And then I know you guys done some some of the EPs as well. Um, mm-hmm. There's a couple of remixing of remixing and just do whatever it was going to be. I remember when the when the press release came out of where it was announced, it released the album and a press release. A press release. I think Radio Exile at the time were just constantly replaying it again and again. What, what were the what was the the signs of where things ain't ain't ain't, ain't happening here? This is is falling apart. Um, well, I know. Yeah, it's um because that's that's the question everyone everyone wants to know. It's the one question when you've probably been asked a million times. And yeah. Then, it's there, there were certain things with it within the band that um obviously Bally and Jussie at that time weren't I'm not, I'm not saying at each other's throats or whatever like that. It was just like difference of opinion. Bally had his success through his own work as Bally yeah. Jeff Um uh, probably at the same time that probably did get to his head uh to a certain degree. But at the same time he had me there for um guidance but he was bigger than himself at that time because he had b21 and then he had also um his own stuff as well and whatever whatever thing he was doing um it was turning into gold you know he, everything he was doing he was just being hit after hit after hit um and even that time i think bally was getting a bit too big for his boots and uh, so there was a bit of a um an issue in there um, but I, I think the way Bally wanted more out of Jesse was okay. If you're the, you know you're you're the singer of the band, you need to be going out and getting songs. That's your responsibility. You know we'll do the music, but you need to be going out there uh, because that, prior to that it was like we're getting all the songs and we're doing the music for you. You know we've got to a level now, but you need to. Uh, pay a bit more more attention you know you, you know you experience about six years of this now so you need to be out there talking to writers getting new fresh material um we we can't always do always be doing that all the time so there was a bit of a um um i don't not, not argument i mean just um bally felt that just he needed to do more and just he's probably thinking bally's always on my bloody case um, you know, leave me alone. Um, so you know, the, the, there was a bit of tension there because Bally was a bit of a workhorse at the time. He wanted to do 
a lot of things. Um, I'm not saying that just is holding him back. No, 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 nothing, like, nothing like that whatsoever. Um, so it did, did. It got to a stage where obviously Jesse probably had enough, and then decided to um, do his own solo stuff. And so that's. Do you think? Where... Do you think? Like, do you think? Because at the time, and you have message boards at all this time, and all these, all these. Um, I think it was that was the environment where I think. Even artists had different accounts on the uh, Punjab 2000 and all. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, I, I've always said before. I go, there's, you know, there's always two sides to the story, and then there's the truth. Yeah, yeah. Um, if he did his own material for stuff, do you think that the band would have lasted a little bit longer? Um, in what sense? So, like, obviously, you've you've got a distraction of where you're doing like your suffering stuff as well, and you can experiment yeah. and do your things from there. Bali's doing his things from uh, and doing his solo career. If Jesse had uh, his own career and still be part, all three of you still have part of B21 when you come collective, but still are the own ones. Would that have resolved anything or would it, would you reckon it still would have ended the same way? Um, that's a good question. Uh, because I think at that time, Jesse did want to do his, um, his own stuff as well. But that's where I think Bali had a bit, bit of a grievance because then, well, you need to spend a bit more effort with, within B21. Because if you're doing your own stuff, then that means you can get your own songs. Mm. So you need to get songs within B21 as well. Mm. Um, yeah, no, you know, you're right there because just just he was contemplating at that time to do his own stuff. But we Bali was adamant on that aspect by saying that, well, you're just getting the work now because we've um, because you're a part of B21 to to a certain degree. That's why other producers are ringing you saying, "Yo, uh, we want to do a track with you." Um, but you need to show that you've done enough within B21 to start doing your own stuff because since from from Sands of B21 to Public Demand to even Darshan and even to Juani, those were songs that were picked by myself and uh, Bali. Yeah. Um, so I think Bali had a bit of a, a bit of niggle that one minute. If you can uh, opt to do your own stuff, that means you have to go out there and get your own songs. You need to be doing, you need to be doing that with B twenty one as well, mm-hmm. and so yeah, the, there was a bit of a tension there. Uh, but obviously, Jesse wanted his own stuff. So when he when they did announce that, you know, that the band had split up, it was fine. Um, I did try to sit down with Jesse, but obviously, sometimes people don't want to go to that next level. Well, everyone's uh, younger at that stage as well. You know, when you have time is. Yeah, no, but I, I, I've, always said, I've, always, I've always said before, like, I don't, I don't think B21 will ever reach their potential that... Uh, yeah, because that's the, that's what that's the next bit. Is that one of the regrets, like, as a fan, that is definitely one of the regrets of, you know, that yeah, there was at least I mean, three or four different, more levels that it could have could have been. Oh, yeah, oh, definitely. We were we were just um, the, the tip of the iceberg then. We, we had um, a lot of, lot of um, stuff in the, in the pipeline that was... Um, as I said, we hadn't we we haven't even touched our potential yet, uh, because this was just the age of social media just starting to arrive to a certain degree. We just started with emails and you know, sending little video clips, that kind of stuff. Because I think YouTube started in uh, two thousand and five, mm. and um, I think yeah, we split up at the end of twenty two thousand two two thousand three early start two thousand three, mm. um, and so social media hasn't wasn't at the for, uh, forefront the way the, the way it is now and um, so yeah definitely we hadn't reached our potential at all but saying that we had achieved so much without social media and this was more word of mouth and just the stuff films that was, yeah, yeah yeah and like like even like things like when we were approached by um grinda cheddar for bendy la beckham i i thought first when the I had a phone call from Grinda, like, you know, this is this is a wind up or something, because she goes, Well, I've heard a lot of you like, guys, and she goes, I've heard a lot about you guys, but uh, we need a band at, for the end scene. And all I've been hearing is you need to get these guys called B21. Um, and so, um, you know, I, what, is it possible to get you guys on there? And I was going, What's the film about? It's called Brenda Beckham. And she goes, woo, woo. And she, she did say, We are. Um, actually trying to get Beckham to be actually yeah. make a guest appearance in there. I go, okay, uh, we'll love to be a part of that uh, project that you're doing, uh, which at the end of the day, Ben La Beckham did 
very well at the box office. Um, very well. <laughs> I, I, I actually, I remember going down to the cinema to actually watch it. Um, down, I was in Star City. Um, and the only reason I went to watch it was to watch the end credits. Because <laughs> <laughs> your name comes up at the end, you know, yeah. um, of the music and everything. So I just I just wanted it. And I was I had a big smile on my face because, mm-hmm. you know, to me, that, that was an achievement, having um, your music, your songs being played on a film and then, you know, you being credited for it at the end of the film because normally you watch every other film you don't see your name on there but on this particular film you've got yeah. your name on there and uh, so i was i was quite chuffed with um the whole um uh, benny Lab, um beckham project did you uh, ever did you um going back to a little bit of the split and the, the immediate aftermath i mean it was i think it's no secret it was pretty, pretty nasty in terms of the the way that it was and you know from a from a fan point it, it, no, it was, okay I, I can answer it was nasty from one side it wasn't nasty from both sides it was nasty just on one side which it's you know, so some people their level of um how, how i don't know how to say it. it's like there's other ways the ways there's ways of doing stuff and there's ways of not yeah. doing stuff some people want to opt for the the silly way, yeah. um, which um, I never want to get involved in because to me, life's, life's short. Yeah. Just get on with it. Make the most of what you can. But some people want to make a, a big song and dance about it, which is not my kind of um, thing. I'm, I like to keep myself to myself. Um, if you got an issue, talk to me about it. I ain't got a problem. But some people are different. Um, Did you have a lot? What, what I'm getting at is like, from a, from a movie box point of view, you're one of the biggest assets on the label, if not the biggest, right? Yes. Um, you've got respected people in the industry. Was there ever a point where you all can have a sit down and say, "Listen, look, you let, let's try and hash it out. Everyone wins here if it kind of comes together." Or, yeah, or did no, it, it's, was it too far? Like I'm just seeing it as from a from a sensible point of view. Yeah, no, a, um, you know, it, no it, emotion. No, okay. To put it at that time, what everyone did was everyone did what they did was right in their eyes, but at the same time, it was wrong. Um, and so, you know, two, two wrongs don't make a right, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, what everyone did at that time was right. Um, but same time, it shouldn't have happened. Yeah. It could have been dealt uh, better. And uh, to be honest with you, yeah, it could have been dealt much better. Uh, but certain things weren't being told by certain people. So that's where it all got jumbled up. And uh, some people got their wires crossed up. Um, but shit happens. Yeah. Sometimes shit happens. It's life. You, yeah, it's life. Yeah, and you have to learn from your mistakes. Um, and obviously, I think um, some people benefited from it and some people didn't. Um, but at the same time, we, myself and Bally, we, we were determined to just um, carry on with, um, with, with B21 due to the fact that it was, as I said in the start of the interview, it was more of a Bally project. Yeah. This was. And did he take it more personally than for like what I'm saying is like he did. He did, did you think he ever recovered from it? Because there was you like you obviously you guys were performing and stuff from there, and then his solo stuff he, he kind of just went it he just went off and doing whatever he's had and, and whatever, right? But do you think it, it was one of the like a trigger for him to kind of I would say definitely, yeah, that was probably a trigger for him, not because I think he he realized what uh, what's happened, and that was a sort of trigger. Like, why? You know, it's um, no. At the same time, it, um, Bally was um, I can't say he was the angel, you know. Mm-hmm. And then some other people were bad people. Now, Bally was quite uh, vocal about certain things as well. So, he, Bally wasn't the um, innocent party there. He wasn't like the angel. He he played he, he played a big part in there as well. But as I said, you learn from your mistakes. Um, and obviously, we um, re-signed with the um, record label back in 2006. So there was an issue with um, the record label. We sat down uh, around a table, discussed certain things, and we came to an amicable uh, agreement, which should have been done back in the day. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I say. at the time, certain things shouldn't have happened, but they did happen. As you said, life goes on. Uh, we reconciled with the with the record label. Now, you probably next question probably have you reconciled with Justice Sidhu? Uh, no, 
uh, we love Rexall, but it, it, we don't really pay much attention, not in a bad way, of whatever he's doing. Uh, but yeah, he's, 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 he's said quite a few things in, in the past. Um, but I know him better than anyone. Um, that's that's one thing that normally gets him in him himself into trouble, is saying stuff when he shouldn't. Um, but that's just him. That's the way he is. Um, but yeah, good luck to him on that. And I mean, we've we've, we've never sort of looked back uh, on that. Obviously, we, we're still doing our gigs here and then. And same time after the split. The funny thing about it, we were actually more busier. Um, no, 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 like a like a piss take where we were actually more busier uh, without Jussie because people, as I said, the main person in Beachman was more uh, Bali um, than everyone wanted to just get a piece of Bali. Um, he was he was um, wicked with the lads. The women were. All of him like a rash, um, yeah. but Bali was the 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 main attraction with um, B twenty one because he was the more of the entertainer. He knew he knew how to talk to the crowd. He was more approachable. Um, he he had a he had a thing got um, going for him. But as as you said, um, this probably was a trigger where he just you know wasn't interested in it anymore. Yeah, so I'm um, you know it's 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 a, sh- it's a shame as well, but as I said, shit happens, and you just got to move with it on. Well, I'm 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 things. gonna I'm gonna keep in the uh, the forever still B21 fan club, and this whole one day <laughs> that you can amicably sit down and and you know like just be at least civil. Let's put it that. Way. Oh yeah, definitely, okay. definitely. You know what I mean? Okay, so I, I want to just kind of be a bit more cheerier. <laughs> chapter, you know, because like, no, it's, it's I think, right, yeah, I think I'm, everyone's I'm done. Watching. I think everyone's done well in their in their own bits, and I think that's the only way you, you could you could try and do that. You know, to t- try and be positive on it as well. Yeah, no, because I remember someone asked me to go, "Yo, um, do you think that Jesse would have achieved anything if he hadn't um, done this stuff with B twenty one? Which was a good question to ask. I'm going, yeah. Because the the point was when we B twenty one we did put a lot a lot of um, time and effort into that. It wasn't like just a let's just do it. We did spend a lot of, uh, a lot of time, especially Bali. He spent a lot of time in, in the studio, save like certain tracks like Giovanni, where he spent phenomenal time because he did virtually two mixes to that song. Uh, one obviously the the hip hop version and then the um, the desi version. Um, and so yeah, Bali did spend a lot a lot of time and. Both myself and Bali did spend a lot of time working with Jussie. Uh, but as I said, these days, you, you don't get that. Producers don't want to work with artists for that long. They just want to quickly, if if a, uh, a singer wants to go to a producer, you'll produce me to They'll do it. You go, yeah, we'll do it quickly. They won't spend that extra, extra mile to get a polished, you know, if, you, if you know what I mean, like have the vision to go, actually, point was we were all b21 it wasn't like we were working for jesse or just you know help to help his career but any other producer would just give a, a mediocre track to him musically or you know picking songs for him um and so you asked me so somebody asked me to go do you think that jesse would have had that same kind of uh, thing if he hadn't worked with you guys to achieve what was achieve a goal and uh, to be honest with you, I, I would probably say no, um, because other producers won't spend that much time with. I don't, I don't think any producer, because these days, artists, the singers just want um, music done by certain producer, Dem Gra, Tom Gra, and the producers go, "Yep, safe. This is how much I charge. I'll do your track." Mm. But they won't actually spend that time to go, "Okay, let's really think about this track. How's it going to be?" You know, they'll just knock it out ASAP because they want the name on it. Producer, a uh, singer wants this producer to work on it, but with Beethoven, we see, we did use spend a lot of time picking the tracks and then actually delivering the music, which these days I think that that's lacking. Well, who yeah, so. in this current moment in time is it's a nice kind of segue into that? Who's some of your favorite producers who you kind of keep out, uh, keep out, or you like the like their work? Um, oh, to be honest with you, I think the uh, one of my favorite producers is probably um, Cam Frantic. Um, such a such a humble guy, and um, 
a fantastic musician. Um, and he's probably number one on my list. Uh, probably number two, if anything, Ravi Bell uh, from the UK. Very under underestimated art uh, producer. Um, he, 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 I can always tell a Ravi Bell production. I can always tell a Cam Frantic production because their their kind of music sort of stands out to me. I could tell straight away. And but at the same time, I can all, I can also tell um, new producers that actually haven't produced their own music. They get someone else to do it for them, but the name goes on. The album has so and so has produced it, but completely a, a, like more like a ghost producer and where ghost producer where people like Cam Frantic have done a lot of work, but haven't have get that acknowledgement that saying, "Oh well, I've done and I know Cam's done so many tracks." <laughs> yeah, he, as, he, as he, was a, he was a, he was the industry at one stage, really. No, I know <laughs> that's what I mean, but. People like him should be acknowledged, should be on the floor, yeah. on, 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 on the right at the front because he's a absolute genius um, producer and, and musician. Uh, but these kind of people, they, they're, they're not given the credit that they, that they do. Yeah. Uh, where artists should really put them at the foremost where they should be acknowledged, like, this guy has actually produced this album for me. Yeah, because if he's playing everything on the album, uh, guitars, bass, programming, it's more of a Cam Frantic production, not the artist production. Um, and the um, producer doesn't get that that much acknowledgement for what he's done. So, yeah, I, I always take my hat off to people like um, Cam Frantic, Ravi Bal, uh, even people like Rishi, uh, Rishi Rich. Because um, I, I know these kind of people, they actually do produce their own music where you get the new producers, where they say they produce their own music, but they actually don't. And, and that's one of my biggest pet hates, is like, mm. always give uh, credit ways to you. Uh, and you, and you work with new singers everything. as well, in the, in, the, in the bands as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I work with new singers as well, but um, it's, uh, this day, the, the market's changed. If, 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 I mean, obviously, it has changed drastically, where back in the 80s and 90s, it was a more band efforts, uh, but these days, it's more about the artist, um, not not about the band. It's it's just it's just about the artist, like like amount of stuff that's been filtered from India. Um, when was the last time you saw a band, uh, a new band on the scene? I haven't, man. Yeah, it's I'll see you. I just follow no, you. I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the 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 only thing you see now is solo artists. Yeah, I don't. I haven't. No, I, I don't, man. I, and, I don't. And, and, and so, so you need me. to ask the question: like, why was the the band scene so healthy back in the eighties and nineties, and these days it's it's other PAs or, um, it's you know, you know, playing back CDs, you know, CD that kind of just it's my off tracks, which obviously B twenty one were. The originators. No, no, I, 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 I do remember that when uh, we did start with B Twenty One, we started off the um, the PA kind of market where we were doing a half an hour set, forty five minutes set, um, just doing a PA to our own stuff, um, and obviously the the bands obviously weren't too impressed with that because we were. Just, Quickly yeah, yeah. put our CD on, in and out, jobs done. Um, and certain bands were hating that because they are they they're, they're not doing it live. They're not doing it live. But I, you know, I'm going well. I've been in the live scene. And yeah, it, it is. It's, it's a bit of a, um, a headache. Um, getting all your you know the band rehearsing, getting it on tip top. It, and we were finding and we were going, getting bookings left, right, and centre just to do a PA. I remember you used to have a mini disc player. Yes, I mean. Just, and I used to, I I saw you have one of them at Samsons, and I thought I gotta get one of these. Yeah, no. I think I bought yeah. about two. I think I bought one George Michael album. Some some yeah, shit this, like that. That I was that, that was a little crazy, but that 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 faded out, and I saw yeah. USB. Um, that's I mean because of, so we started the the um the the, the PA craze market, mm. um, but we at the same time we were good at it as well. It wasn't like the, we, I I I have, I have seen certain artists that do PAs uh, nowadays, but people think it's easy. Oh, you, you just lip, you lip sync and go, but yeah, but there's a, there's a bit of an art to it as well. Yeah. You can't just 
turn up and go, yeah, I'll, I'll monitor. You've like, got to you sell to, it as well. Yeah, you, you, you've got to definitely got to sell it as well. And so there is a bit of an art to it as well. Isn't it? People think it's easy, but it, it's not. Um, but that's why we were so, we were good at it because we would do it bang on to um, the track and also deliver the performance as well. So in hand in hand, you, you know, you, it's, it's easy just, just being an artist, but to deliver. And then at the same time, you've got to entertain your crowd. So do you, uh, yeah, I, I just want to, you know, you just talked a bit about the live band and like you were, you're part of the Jazzy B band and it wouldn't be a yeah. podcast without me mentioning his name anyway. So, you know, do you, does, you know, when you're working and you're, and you're sitting with him and you're reminiscing or you're going and you go back to the old school, is that the, some of the, is that the same kind of conversations that you have when you, where you think about it or do, because you, you're not getting, you're not getting the new stream of new musicians coming in again. Mm. The audience's flavors are are changing now, where people are doing songs, and there's not one dissy instrument in the song anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, music like you know it changes like uh, like fashion. So um, yeah, I mean the, the latest stuff that's coming out from you know the latest stuff from India and all that stuff. It it is sort of moving towards the. Not, I'm not saying losing the Punjabi element, but it's it's going more. Well, it is because they're not putting anything in there apart from the vocal. Yeah, I know it's it, it's hard. No, I mean, it's it, it's it's hard to go. I mean, in this day and age now, it's more about rap music, you know, that gangster kind of flex, which personally, don't, I'm, it's not appealing to me. I've I've never been, you know, gone towards that. like even like. Like um, you know, um, Sid Musiala um, was never into his tracks at all. Um, I, I'm I'm just being honest. Yeah. Um, it was only when he obviously he passed away, and um, I heard one of his tracks, um, uh, two nine five. I'll be honest with you, I was taken back. I go, yo, I can't believe um, the man actually wrote this track and the way he delivered it next level and so and that's when I started listening to his um, songs and I go okay fair play and you know what I mean but that's sometimes the, the, the next is that, is that uh, is, is, is what I'm going to ask you is that one of the reasons that you're apprehension of releasing some of your stuff because you just know it's not going to be for this market yes and yes and no because it, it has changed now I, I, I I don't know why, because a lot of stuff that comes from India, it's um, everyone's trying to be on that kind of gangster tip, or the trap beat, uh, yeah, and trying to trying to act like something that you're not. I mean, even with like people people like um, Sidhu Musiala, you know, he gave into you one saying that um, he wanted to live his life like Tupac. Um, yeah, but my only argument with that, but not in a, in a bad way, is like Tupac was singing about things that happened in his life um but that's not happened to you you've never had you know you you never had that the way Tupac you know the way he lived his life and he's the way the the rappers and the you know the the black market sing about stuff is about personal things that's happened within their lives yeah. and but you're but you're Punjabi but you have you haven't lived that life but you want to live that life but I I I can't understand why yeah. yeah, you you might idolize certain people, and uh, saying, "Oh, I like Tupac's music," but as I said, look, Tupac always just sing about things that happened in his life and brought him out in songs. Yeah. Um. And but if, if you do see the Indian market now, they're all coming across, um, trying to be, uh, not not trying to be. I mean, they're portraying themselves as gangsters or you know, big time. I'm going, but why? What, why are you trying to, you know, which to me doesn't make sense. Um, it's like, you know, we, uh, when people are trying to have a, you know, you know, walk around with guns and that kind of stuff. And obviously the younger market, um, the younger generation see that and they probably think it's that's the norm. Uh, it's it's okay for to go around shooting people or, but because I mean, the artists these days, they do need to think about that, you know, due to social media, there's a lot of people out there now. Uh, and if, if, if that's the way you want to portray yourself, 
people will try to copy you to certain degrees. Mm. Um, so you just, just be careful, you know, how you come out across there. So um, do you, you think shouldn't, you should you, sh- you shouldn't be? I mean, I mean, say place like India is like when the one thing that they they're lacking is probably education, um, and people in India just want to come out with a badass video walking around with guns and uh, knocking out people shooting people and but that's not life you know what i mean it's you know that's the only problem i see with the with the industry at the moment now it's trying to trying to act like the 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 rap market where obviously you know you think that's changed now because of the passiveness and all that you can see that might slow down or change a little bit i don't know because obviously the the Indian market now they've got access to social media, and so when they watch um, black artists, when they you know uh, they've got issues with other artists, they're trying to act the same kind of way. You know, I see you in in Napangalerna, on Napangalerna. Well, I'm going well. That you know, that's that's their culture. That's the way they've been brought up. You guys haven't been brought up. You've been doing Katie Bari, um, and why don't you you know stick to what you're good at? You know, talk if you want to act like them, act like them, but talk about your lives in the, in that aspect. You lot don't you lot don't walk around with guns and all that stuff. So why are you trying to act like oh, that? You do the rap market, you know the the and the black market is that like they've experienced that they've had you know threats made, they've been shot at, um, and they're making songs about it, which you know you can relate to, but you lot haven't been in that kind of field, but you're trying to portray that kind of image to the next generation or oh, with this with that now nah, just just stick to what you're good at stick to your roots just stick to Punjabi culture yeah well, I, I mean as I said music and beats and everything you know, obviously I think the, uh, the market now it's more westernized uh, with more hip hop beats being involved you know which, which you know it's to me it's not a problem and it's also you know the new generation that appeals to them yeah and obviously, I don't know why to certain degree, but they they like that kind of new vibe now, uh, where you know uh, there's rapping in songs. Uh, obviously, it's, it's been happening for the last 10, 15 years now, but it's, it's been accepted now um, because back in the eighties and nineties, like they say, um, back in the day, Def Jam, uh, Happy, and his brother, they were doing rapping then back in the 90, uh, early nineties. Um, and now that's a big thing. Now that's we really, needed, you know, 20, 30 years down the road, where what they were doing back back in the days, that's what's happening now. It's 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 a bigger market with rap, but these guys are doing it back um in you know early nineties where it wasn't appreciated there, but now it's 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 common thing now. And if you do hear tracks from India now, it's um hardly any music pieces there, it's more rap, um, and that and that kind of vibe. Which at the same time you you are losing a bit of bit of Punjabi, but the the next generation they they like it, they like it. So you can't really argue with it, and you can't you can sit there and go, oh it, that's not proper music. But it is, it, you know, music comes in all different uh, shapes and um, genres. Yeah. But that's the way it is, though. So you can't argue with it. I'm gonna bring it to a close now, and I'm gonna bring it and summarize it in there. So this is the longest podcast I've done. Now. I'm loving it. Um, what time is it now? What bad? Just have you know? Oh, man, fuck's sake. <laughs> Miss Matty today and everything. Okay, so just a quick one. Um, so you're coming towards nearly 40 years in, 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 in music. Um, so you've seen quite a, seen quite a lot. I've seen you do the quick maths there. Um, you, um, how long do you reckon that you're going to have in this mu- in the in the music game? Do you see yourself forever doing it? Or do you see to a point where... Actually, I just want to sit back, relax, and enjoy what all the kind of successes that you've done. No, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, I personally think I have been one of the luckiest guys in, in in the industry. To be honest with you, people always trying to put me on a, some kind of pedestal, like, um, "Yo, you're 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 wicked, you're wicked." I'm going, buddy. I'm just I'm just a normal person. Nah, see, I, 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 that's where you. Might, I think no. If there's I, I, a hall I, I, of fame, no, you're no, in that okay, first okay, class. Okay. No, I'll ask you. Yesterday, you saw me. I was on the keys. I was with yeah. uh, Stephen Salter. Yeah. I had I, the amount of guys I had around me. Just, and I, I'm trying to do my job. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're just in my ear going, 
buddy, you're, you're, you're bad, man. You're wicked, man. I'm going, buddy, thank you. You know what I mean? And but we all, so, but we, okay, here's the point then. Then we all can't be wrong. You, well, you all can't be right as well, but I'm just, <laughs> no, but it's, it's like, to me, it's, it's, it's when people come to me and, and to me, I find, not even embarrassed. I mean, when, because one guy yesterday goes, he's coming, goes, yo, you're badass. I mean, no, no, I'm not, just, you know, and someone went in my head, I'm going, leave me alone, leave me alone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but isn't it, it but it's the point of where like your music for example it, we've we haven't really scratched the service on even in this amount of time where mm. you've let's say Roger Roger you know, the Rich the, the Sadar then you've got all the sufferings every all the albums and from that age it's been a soundtrack of their life you know what I mean yeah. and, you, and so when you when they hear the music that you've produced it 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 reminds of these certain stages no, of, I, I, of their I, life I think one thing I always I, I, I always makes me laugh is when people come up to me and they go, "Bro, good because of your music, I survived university." I and, did college. Another well, five messes with, with me because that was one of the only cassettes that I had on my Walkman at that time, and, and I just I, used to listen to it all the time. That that no that to me that one is the most thing I always hear. You go, bro, listen up, because of you guys, yeah, and because of your music, I I you know. I passed college. I did, you know, went to school, all that stuff, and that brings a big dirty smile on my face. Yeah, um, no, but as I said, I got. It's like people always. I I get embarrassed when people come up to me, go, "Buddy, you know, uh, uh, even though I was I was at a wedding last week, and and these people have come from Kinda, and someone had told them that, oh, that's uh, Peter Jackpot over there, and uh, the. The ladies come with, uh, over with her, with her husband. They go, you, are you Buddha Jackpot? And I'm there. I'm there with my family. I go, yeah. And they go, oh, we're your biggest fan. Can we have a picture with you? And my daughter's there. They're pissing themselves. They're, they're, they're like, <laughs> what are you doing? I go, I go um, can we have a picture with you? I go, um, yeah, you can. It's no problem. And my daughter just laughing there. I'm, I'm like, oh, yes, right. And they go, and they, and they go, and they, they're like, going, we can't believe we're actually standing here with you. I'm going, what what is it not to believe? I go, I'm just like a normal person. And they go, but you've helped us when we went through uni school, which I I understand. I understand because music, as I just say, music is a universal language. Yeah. Uh every, everyone can say it. But I I, I do I, I do get a bit of a sense of achievement when people tell me that I've helped them in in a certain way, mm-hmm. even though it's coming through music. But to me, that's you know that's one of the benefits of you know doing doing this kind of you know, working in this kind of industry, is like if I made a difference in someone's life, I'm happy, man. Yeah, just, I'm happy. just listen. If anyone comes up to you and they do that, it's out of love. Okay, so yeah, um, it's yeah, out of love. So there you go. So oh, then, la- last question, last question. Um, yeah. so this is called the bandwagon. So either it's an opportunity where people either jump on a bandwagon or they jump off a bandwagon. Or if there's anything that the the guest wants to get off their chest, I this is the space for them to do so. Um, now yeah, I I think you know me. I yeah. I don't really say anything to anyone. I I do I do get, Keep myself from myself. Uh, I think I've been, as I said, the luckiest person in this industry. Um, some people wouldn't agree with that, but I, I've always, I've always thought that myself that I'm a very, very lucky person to have I've worked with certain people with industry, to have had certain tracks within the industry, and what you see is what you get, and you're not going to get any more or less. Uh, so I'm not gonna say I'm mean, I am a flan, I am go. I'm just one person that enjoys doing his music. And I appreciate everyone who's appreciated my music mm. uh, or appreciated any work I've done, even recording or being on the live circuit. Um personally, I, I've I've always loved music. Um it's always been with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope I can still can continue doing music. Personally, I feel that I've still got plenty to give out there um, and hope to to release some more tracks with. But I hope that people still appreciate it. That's my only concern is like, uh, like, 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 like you did say, go, I, I, I might be feeling nervous that I haven't released my own stuff but all the stuff i released i always class as, as my own solo stuff yeah, so. yeah. but listen look there's still us as the market 
He says, there's always those kids that don't who listen to all the other rubbish. We, we, still got, <laughs> we all still want it. Oh, no, I mean, I, I, I definitely appreciate that. No, as I mean, as I said, I, I, I always feel like I've been uh, blessed um, within this industry um, to achieve what I've achieved. Um, is like people always try, try and tell you, oh, you've done this, you've done this. Even I sometimes forget what I've done. It was people have to actually remind me to go, yeah. you produce this track. I remember a couple of uh, weeks ago I was with a guy, a young lad, uh, Vishal, uh, plays door and everything. Yeah. And he's playing me tracks. He goes, Oh, you produce? I go, Did I produce that? He goes, Yeah, you did that. I go, Shit, man, I, go, I can't remember. He goes, Geezer, come on, man. I go, And then he's, he pulled out another track. He goes, You produce this? I go, Honestly, and I, I don't want to say. I hope it's not bloody old age, but yeah. I'm going. That's what I'm trying to get you to release all this. No, and, and and I, I was I, I get dazzled when people go, "Yo, you produced." I'm going. I actually have to. I have to think about it. I'm going. Actually, yeah, actually. Then when I, when I do hear it properly, I go, "Actually, I did produce that." Yeah, but I forgot all about it. But as I said, yeah, it's um, it's so far. I've, I've had a tremendous journey in um, this um, field. I mean. Um, I hope to continue a couple of more years, hopefully touch wood. Uh, but at the same time, I just want to say thanks to everyone for supporting me nearly over the last 30 odd years. Um, so, yeah, and I'll hopefully I can still uh, meet your requirements of good music, good lyrics. Uh, <laughs> so I've been blessed so far, so I can't go wrong. At the same time, like, um, you know, I've still got a family now, so... Um, I do certainly spend more time with the family. My daughters are now grown up. They're, they're both um, got their degrees. Yeah, I'm okay. happy with that. Um, and so I've got everything in life I wanted. So, um, and sometimes you know, it's very hard for people to say that, that they're happy with their life. I am I am very happy with whatever I've achieved. Uh, I've got the best of everything. So, um Honestly, thank you, man. I really appreciate. I hope you enjoyed. I no, you thank you very, for. Really no, I, I, I'll, I'll actually like to say thank you to yourself because you have been waiting for a long time to <laughs> um, get me on the podcast. Uh, this is probably the second podcast I've done. First, yeah. I was sat man. Yeah. Um, and that was, to be honest with you, True School. He um, one that gave me a bit, bit of a kick up the ass to say, "Oi, Cardi, uh, do the damn bloody pod podcast." It's for sat man. <laughs> I go, all right. Uh, but yeah, as I said, you did contact me some time ago and I, I haven't been avoiding it, but I just... I know, I get it, I get yeah, it. You, you, yeah, you, you, you go, it's, it's, it's always, oh, then, so how did you start? You know, yeah, 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 well, yeah, yeah. Well, When you did this one, yeah, I'm going, it, to me, it's it's like, I, 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 I'm, I'm always saying it, you know, the same yeah. kind of stuff I'm going. And one thing I hate is talking about myself. <laughs> yeah, no, well, you've done it. I think we've done a bloody good job on this one. Yeah, so, yeah, no, it's, it's 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 always fun, but but it's nice because it, it does bring back memories yeah. of what I've done. Well, I've always found when I've spoken to the the guest the next day that they've always had a good night's sleep after it because they're like, oh, I did, it just invokes so much when they reflect back on it. It's just oh, no, weird it, thing. no, I mean, especially this month with obviously um uh, with um the passing of Sufri as well. Um, it did bring back a lot, um, due to like you know, we the what we achieved with the Suffrage Boys. Um, the, the actually, the, I'll, I'll be honest with you, the, the, the day Suffrage passed, it didn't hit me, hit me the next day, and it hit me hard. You know, I, I was slightly bad, I was in tears because I was, I had the radio on and they're just playing Suffrage all day long, mm. and it, 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 it hit me then, yeah, you because know, the first day I, I was too still trying to you know you know get my thoughts together mm. next day when i had some time to myself it hit me hard i'm like gosh i go the man the, you know what we achieved with the software boys it was on a, on a next level as well you know we mm. we you know it was a dream come true you know to work with someone like software as well but as i mean that's life though and um i'm just i'm just grateful i am i am just grateful that i've i've you know, had to work with people like this. Um, the songs I've worked with, the arts I've worked with. I'm just, I'm just grateful. So I ain't, I ain't got no issues with no one in the industry, uh, even though people might think I have. But now nah, I'm just a happy, go lucky person. Um, and I just, I'm just there to do my job. That's it. And I hope people appreciate it. Booty Jagpa, thank you very much. <laughs> respect. Yeah, respect to you, man. Thanks to everyone for listening. Peace no, out. No.